good morning from Council Chambers. We are live on, in Council Chambers. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this meeting back to order and do a roll call of council members. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Principe. Good morning. Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Paquette. Councillor Paquette. Councillor Tang. Councillor Tang. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. All right, Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. All right, could somebody move that uh, the uh, sum uh, a summary of agenda changes? Councillor Salvador, you want to do that? Sure. Um, I'll move that the following be added. The November 28th, 29th, 30th, 2022, City Council non-statutory public hearing, budget meeting agenda, uh, replacement attachment 7.2, proposed 2023 to 2026 operating budget attachment one. Second. Second by Councillor Rice, please vote. Yes, yes. Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. I'm um, yes as well. And I'm a yes to it, Council Rutherford. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I know. I'm in a wrong meeting. <laughs> I'm in a today's meeting, but in a wrong. We're just tab. missing Council Rice. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Okay. Display the votes, please. Okay, it is carried. Okay. Uh, we dealt with that. I will go through the list. Uh, you gave me the new list, clerk, right? Rama, can you give me the new list for panel, the remaining panel? I misplaced it somewhere. Well, it's on the new list, right? Yeah. Here you go. Got it. Okay. Okay, so we have, uh, we concluded with panel nine yesterday, but uh, I'm gonna run through the list again, just in case if somebody is joining us now that we missed on panel nine. Uh, who did we not hear from? David, Megan, Daniel, Richard, Han, uh, Shushit, Roon, uh, Kimo, Milan, Andrew Curry. I'll call Andrew Curry. No. And uh, Jasmine Chong. Yes, I'm here. Okay. As and Heather Thomas. She's here too. Okay. Well, we'll go to you. Uh, uh, I'll go to Jasmine first. Then I'll come back for uh, for Heather. For uh, each each of you will have five minutes to make your presentations. Please go ahead. Jasmine, go ahead, please. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> I'm, never, I'm a little bit nervous. It's my first time presenting in English. Don't be nervous so. at all. We, we are, we are. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jasmine, and I represent Breast Friends Edmonton Dragon Ball Racing Team. 
I would like to share my personal story. I'm a two-time breast cancer warrior. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2020 during the pandemic. I had a lumpectomy done followed by radiation therapy. After surgery and radiation treatment, I was monitored every six months for two years, making sure I was cancer free. I joined Breast Friends Edmonton Dragon Ball Racing Team last year, where I had the opportunity to have virtual fitness training and in-person paddling for a few months during the beautiful summer in Edmonton with a team of amazing women who are also breast cancer warriors. Our mission first, to encourage those who have been diagnosed with breast cancer to lead full and active lives. Second, to demonstrate the benefits of an active lifestyle through the sport of dragon boating. Third, to raise awareness about breast cancer and encourage the pursuit of a cure. Fourth, to provide support and fellowship to team members. And lastly, to have fun. Joining Breast Friends gave me a way to be physically active in a positive and encouraging environment through dragon boating. We all had been through similar health experiences and by paddling together, we helped raise awareness about breast cancer and as well as supporting each other along the way. Then this year in 2022, the cancer had came back at the same spot on my right breast. Even my family doctor was uh, very shocked to tell me the biopsy result. I was able to get some very practical advice about breast reconstruction options from my team who had also gone through similar surgeries. I have my life-changing surgery and chemo done during this summer, a mastectomy, and breast reconstruction was performed, followed by more aggressive systemic treatments, including chemo, target therapy, and hormone therapy treatments. Since my pathology report shows I'm triple positive. During my second time in recovery, the people of Breast Friends have shown Anna's support, which is why I can't wait to join my team and paddle with them for another year. Breast Friends crews have been to festivals across Canada and participated in international survivor festivals in Australia, Vancouver, Ontario, Florida, and Italy, so on. Next year, 2023 in April, Breast Friends will go to New Zealand to participate the IBCPC Participatory Dragon Ball Festival. The IBCPC Dragon Ball Festival is held every three to four years, organized by the International Breast Cancer Paddlers Commission. The festival is an international non-competitive participatory event for breast cancer paddlers teams who engage in Dragon Ball activities as post breast cancer diagnosis rehabilitation. The New Zealand 2023 festival will involve a selection of teams from the current 240 team members from 30 countries across all continents. And we, Breast Friends, represent Edmonton from Canada. As one of Breast Friends member, we hope City can continue to support us by granting us annual funding so that we are able to help warm more women like me. Our motto is awareness and hope in a dragon boat. Thank you of your time today. Thank you, Jasmine, for uh, joining us and uh, sharing your story. You did well, you know, so there's no, no nervousness we saw in here. So thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for thank you. having the courage to, uh, to do so. And uh, uh, next we'll go to uh, Heather Thomas. Heather, are you, can you, uh, 
We can hear you. We can't hear you, Heather. Here we go. Heather, can you start now? We can't hear you for some reason. No. Can you unmute yourself in the Google Meet? Okay. Can, do you mind calling in? There should be a phone number in your email address. So while the Heather is uh, dialing in, uh, we have two remaining panels, and uh, we have uh, about 18 people on panel 10, and 16 people on panel 11. So hopefully we'll be able to conclude the non-stat sometime today. Yes. Sorry, Rama? Um, I, I think we should just recess for a little bit because we have to hear from her before we resume questions. Yeah. Um, if you could just give us a few minutes to yeah, recess to reach out to her. Yeah, because she's the last speaker, yeah, right? Yeah, she's so, the yeah. last speaker yep. okay. unless you, yeah, because we can't resume questions on this panel until we hear from yes, her. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
So uh, if you could, all the, uh, all the folks who are here, who were part of panel nine, if you could please step up and sit in these spaces that you were sitting yesterday. Yeah, we'll, uh, Heather will be moved to panel 10, right? So we can proceed with the questions to panel nine. And in the meantime, they'll try to figure out the technological uh, issues that, uh, that are there. So I don't know what's going on, but we'll figure it out. Okay. All right, questions, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you so much uh, to, to all of our speakers uh, who were with us yesterday and, and joined us again this morning. I just had a few quick questions. Um, maybe, uh, Mr. Leon, I'll start with you. Thank you so much for presenting and, and for the work um, that's happening that, that you're helping to lead with the Chinatown Transformation Collaborative Society. You know, I think, um, I think, you know, following through with the, the strategy that we developed makes a ton of sense to me. I know that we're generally looking for some of the external agencies that we're providing funding for to, to come back to council with annual reports and, and updates. Is that something that the, the CTC is open to? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the last time we appeared before council was uh, upon a request from a uh, previous uh, councillor, um, Scott McKean. Okay. So absolutely we can do that. Great. And what, um, what are some of the, the key goals you know, I, William, I really appreciated your vision of, of what Saturday night could look like in Chinatown, and, and I think we can get there. I, I see how, how we, we achieve that. What, and this could be to either of you, um, how do we know that we're moving in the right direction? What sort of measures um, and indicators do you think CTC can be watching for and that we can kind of, you know, collectively assess our, our progress towards that? Well, I think with the CTC, you know, we are a young organization, so a lot of it has been just in developing confidence within our community that they trust us. And oftentimes there's really no quant for that. It's really about being on the ground, um, ensuring that they're, that they're being heard and then that we're able to relay those concerns to this council. Um, another measure that I look at is our ability to develop partnerships with the city of Edmonton. Um, I think the past in Chinatown is that that has been lacking. There has been less correspondence than it should be. I think if, if we have concerns that they needed to be heard, uh, they were not heard in the past. And, and so to me, that, that's another measure, um, is our ability to develop that partnership with you. But then there's also external parties like the Burley Family um, Assist. Any, any not-for-profit or social service that's in the area that we develop relationships with them as well. And I think that is going to be able to make a difference. Not necessarily... Um, maybe how many businesses are we able to land or to lease spaces. But at this point right now, it's about getting our community to come together and to actually continue with the momentum that the city of Edmonton has helped us uh, start. Yeah, well, that's great. And I think, I think there's an opportunity for us to think of some really interesting ways to, to uh, monitor that and, and have that shared understanding of what, what we're working uh, to, to achieving, knowing, knowing the end state that we want, want to reach. Willing, did you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. I think some like one of the key things we want to change right now are attitudes and beliefs around Chinatown. Um, and that's where something like a, a nightly activation actually makes it quite easy to track. Right now there's not much foot traffic at all at night. There's not many businesses open at night. Um, so some of the metrics that we have here for specifically for a night market could be, you know, a number of volunteers involved that's measuring the community building. I mean, their community number of partners involved. Um, number, of number of businesses open late. Um, that's stimulating the nightlife in Chinatown at the foot traffic in Chinatown. So measuring the attitude and beliefs on both sides, the businesses and the community, as well as the, the patrons. Great, yeah, really neat suggestions. Thank you for that. Um, and then my, my other question was just for Mr. Dodge, if he's still online. Perhaps not. I'm here. Oh. Just, uh, scrambling for the mute button. <laughs> Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you. Thanks for, for coming back to join us. You know, I, I appreciated your commentary and, uh, you know, you flagged, uh, you know, a building that was under development and, um, you know, switching that to be net zero. You know, something something that weighs on me a little is that some of our, our bigger proposed investments, uh, for example, the Lewis Farm Rec Center, currently isn't designed to be emissions neutral. So just wondering your thoughts on that and the opportunities and... Um, yeah, any ideas about uh, how we move forward on that? You know, 
And I'm not sure why that one isn't that way because the sustainable buildings policy uh, does call for new facilities to be net zero. So I'm not sure how, maybe it's an old project or something. Uh, yeah. They definitely should be because it's probably something we'll need to address later on again anyways. And, you know, I cited the Salvation Army example because they were astounded that at the cost that they encountered uh, to go uh, net zero ready, they still have some gas in their building to run the kitchen and a few other things. Uh, so I'm not sure why it's not. Okay, and, and I think you're flagging too that upfront costs versus later retrofits, there may be some, some cost savings there. Okay, thank you so much, that's my time. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll also stick with David Dodge. Um, so you've been involved with ETCRC for seven years, I think you said, is that right? Well, I don't know if my memory's right, but since the beginning, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, and as a committee member, projects would often be brought forward seeking advice and feedback. Where has that feedback been reflected in this budget? That is a great question. <laughs> um, I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna be cynical and say I don't see it. So, you know, in the past we had a lot of impact and uh, there's a lot of great uh, and very talented and knowledgeable people on the committee. And we saw the impact on everything from the city plan to district energy plans and policies and, and that sort of thing. This budget, um, yeah, <laughs> we were pretty much astounded when we looked at it. Uh, as we indicated, you know, I really hated to make a speech like that as, as do all of my other colleagues because we've had such a great relationship and council has such a strong vision for this sort of thing. Um, it was a hard speech to write because uh, I don't see it in the budget. Yeah, well, no, I really appreciate that. And just knowing the, <clears throat> the background and some of the history of the committee um, and how collaborative things have been, I think the fact that we're hearing from so many folks from ETCRC says something. Um, so thanks for, for coming out. Uh, maybe actually just one follow up to that. When it comes to the budget process itself, you, you kind of flagged that as being problematic as well. Um, I think you mentioned kind of council is in this position where we're, we're fighting over scraps yet some really key priorities are left unfunded. Um, so I'm wondering what do you feel would be a, and maybe this is not a fair question, but what, what do you feel would be a good way forward? You know, how do we close that gap between saying and doing? Well, I think it's two things. I, I think it's, um, you know, council directing that the climate emergency is an emergency and it needs to be the precursor to all of our discussions about budget and projects of any kind. And that's the whole purpose of the carbon budget, which we've spent a lot of time developing. And I say we, the royal we there. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I, I think it's going to require a culture change and a shift on this. And I think council needs to direct that shift. Uh, they need to say that this is a priority uh, and it's not, uh, you know, a want, uh, you know, that's the only way it's going to happen. Like right now, what you're fighting over scraps uh, with your individual projects in your, in your different wards, we're, we're not fighting over scraps. There are no scraps. They're not even in. Uh, so, you know, I, I just think the context is broken. And so it, so, you know, I, I'm an expert in, in how the functions, but uh, I think that needs to be fixed. Yeah. Thank you for your comments. Um, and then I just want to switch gears um, to Christy Morin, who is, who's here in person. Um, yeah, you talked about sort of the, the difference between the supports that you see in uh, sort of downtown proper uh, versus, you know, just across the line while still uh, within the vicinity of core communities. And you mentioned broken windows in particular. Um, are there other, or what other supports would you be referring to? Like I assume cleanliness, like enhanced cleaning, what, what other supports would you be yeah, contemplating? The two, two that you mentioned, for sure, Councillor, good morning, everyone, the Mayor. Um, definitely, and also the downtown vibrancy piece. I mean, it stops at 111, and uh, we're just six blocks away. And so we did we did attempt to try, and, and we're encouraged to try, because we're right there on the fringe. And so we did, we did apply, and we're rejected because we're out of the boundary. Um, and then we did Norwood Fair, which actually brought together Macaulay because we're, we're sharing all the same problems. So the vibrancy piece is so essential. So we did a thing called Norwood Fair. And again, it was discouraged to even apply um, because 
you know, it's coming from Alberta Ave. So I think that's really um, distressing to us and to uh, my colleagues, you know, uh, across the board in, in our area because we're, we're trying so hard and we support Chinatown, we support Macaulay. We're all together in this together, it's all for one. And so those are the pieces, like if there's other, other things like the broken windows was just totally disappointing because we've had, like I said, broken windows at our board me meeting when we met two, we, or two months ago, it was almost everyone but two had had broken windows. So the bus shelters, I mean, it's just endless. Yeah, well, thank you for that, and, and thanks for providing a little bit more context, and I think you've identified a, an important gap there. Um, and then, oh, really quickly, uh, just on the the unfunded packages for supporting winter festivals, um, you've liked that as an important one. What does that typically go towards? Can you just fill us in on that? Yeah, so what uh, the administration has put together, from my understanding, reading the package, was to continue funding the signature festivals, so the four that I named, Flying Canoe Valin, uh, Ice on White, Ourselves, and um, Silver Skate, and that's to, uh, I think, a maximum of 50, or it's 50,000 per, and then to also be able to support other seed funding as well. So, and as, as the winter festivals, actually, we talked about it at one of the uh, meetings with civic events, of we're more than willing to meet with folks that are wanting to start things. And and so be able to support whatever way we can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Tang. Oh, great. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for sharing your perspectives and very powerful personal stories. Um, I'll start with Hong uh, around Chinatown. Um, you had mentioned that investment is coming back to Chinatown. Um, any specific like business returning or because I know that has been pretty devastated. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Tang, for that great question. Um, I think it's it's this council needs to know. Um, Avenue Living has reinvested into Capitol Towers. It's their flagship uh, building in Edmonton. Um, they're gutting the whole building, and so um, instead of having a building that used to be a source of social disorder, um, we're, they're looking towards having students and seniors living in that building, and their, their redevelopment is a complete gut. That's so it's a win for our community. As you know, 106 is a, as an area where um, we do see a lot of um, social disorder, and to have something that can offset that, to have a, bring in a new density, a new kind of traffic is very important and vital to our community. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. that's great. Um, that, that's certainly great to hear, and I'm sure there are other examples in the pipeline and, and otherwise, hopefully. Um, so the Chinatown strategy was approved in 2018, and that came with funding of $250,000 a year. And, you know, certainly recognizing there have been challenges in the past, I'm wondering what will be different moving forward um, compared to the last few years so that CTC has the organizational capacity to continue stewarding the Chinatown strategy? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Tang. That's another great question. Um, I think it's important to note that the CTC is, is four years old and there are, um, there are dynamics within our community that we have to overcome. Um, so again, it's about building confidence and so getting the right people like Alan you know, he's been working with the uh, provincial traffic and, and have William Lau in different positions was, took a lot of time. And, and so, so like when, when we compare ourselves to the BIA or the CBA, you know, organizations that have been around for 20, 25 years, it's very difficult for us to, to come in and, and just hit the ground running. And so the past four years has been developing that team and, and getting that strategy, getting that advocacy ready to go. And so what would be different is that now is the time. I think we, we might not have been ready in 2019, but we're definitely ready in 2022, 23. Great, thank you. Um, and William, you know, appreciate that, that narrative changing piece that you talk about. Uh, Jordan Hong recently re released that docu-series, which I thought was excellent because no one else is talking about the changing narrative. And all you see in the media is a very stereotypical portrayal of Chinatown. Um, what do you think about in that docu-series, young people talked about Chinatown being family-friendly, child-friendly. How do you see that being part of that five years from now, that Saturday night? I think in, in, in many ways, it already is. If you look at who's walking the streets, it's often the seniors. It's the families coming to, 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 to spend time with the seniors. Um, but it's, it's often with, you know, within those that, that know that it's safer than it may be perceived. Um, so where the behavior change and, and, and why I'm putting in so much effort now into, into putting together a team for weekly activations is because we, we should, we, we got to stop with the annual events where we do it once a year, we pack up and, and, and when we stop, we need something frequent enough that we can build momentum, we can, we can, we can build our team and we can start to change those attitudes and beliefs. That's, that's great to hear. Um, 
to Mr. David Dodge. Um, really interested to hear about the Salvation Army example, and I think you had mentioned they realize that it's a few percentage difference between a net zero versus a, a status quo design. Can you just be a bit more precise about how much that was? So it was a $23 million project. The quotes came in uh, less than 2% higher to go net zero ready. They can't fit enough solar on the roof to be net zero. Uh, and they were astounded at that. In the end, they spent close to 4% more, but it was not related to going to net zero ready. It was because there was an old dump on their site and they had site remediation issues and issues with drilling holes and things that uh, that had to be dealt with. So there was a $400,000 hit there. So on a $23 million project in the end, it was 4%. Great. They figure their payback is four years. And uh, you had also mentioned, um, can you remind me how much in operational savings each year that they were experiencing? So six, I'm trying to remember, so I think 6. it's 240,000, 6 oh. million divided by 25 years. For, for the Salvation Army, that's like yeah. a gift from the gods. Yeah. <laughs> no, appreciate those, uh, those numbers. Uh, I think that is it for me. Um, I did have some others, but I don't think those speakers are online. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Constable. Thank you, Mr. Prince. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, David Dodge, this question is for oh, you. Oh, Constable Prince, just, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I totally forgot. We have kids. <laughs> oh, we have kids here. Oh, okay. All right, we are joined by Grade six class from Good Shepherd School with their teacher, Thomas Senior. They are visiting us today and uh, uh, their ward counselor is Counselor Hamilton, Ward CP Winniewak. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> there she is, you can see her on the screen. Can you see her on the screen? For her name on it, right? Here we go. Good. All right. Thank you so much for. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, budget, which means how we continue to build our city, uh, for, uh, run the program, services, and the infrastructure that is necessary for you. Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry, Councillor uh, Principal. Oh, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, David Dodge. Uh, thank you. I just want to say thank you for um, being instrumental in making sure that Evansdale Community League has uh, solar panels, so that's wonderful. I would like to know what your opinion is on the most effective uh, climate action plan. What is the number one thing we can do? Uh, well, that's to pick winners and losers. You know, the, the problem with climate change, Karen, is we need to do them all. And uh, our goals, to achieve our goals, we need to transform transportation to zero emissions. That's big. We need to transform build, buildings, which are about another 33% of emissions. That's really big. There's an industry question, which is really hard to solve, and perhaps hydrogen will play a role. And we need emissions-free energy. Uh, so among the things we're working on right now, why I flag the district energy system is if we don't do it now, we're going to lock into problems that we're going to have to solve in the future that are going to be huge. We can make a difference now. I uh, just did a ton of research into hydrogen and district energy. And, you know, even the hydrogen people say there are basically only two ways we're going to be able to heat our homes in, in this new world. And that's either hydrogen or um uh, district energy with geothermal. And so gas is not going to work. I hate to break the news, but even the gas guys say gas is not going to be the future of heating homes. So we either start now or we pay more later. And so that's typical of a lot of the solutions, you know, because you don't start benefiting from the savings, plus the emissions keep piling up, making it ever harder to achieve our goals. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And um, when, when you had, uh, on your presentation, you had mentioned something about the LRT. What are your views on how effective that would be in helping with the climate action plan? I have some personal views on it, and I, I don't have the expertise to uh, weigh the merits uh, of LRT. That's my first confession. I know that we've had discussions at the at the panel, informal discussions about this, but we have definitely not looked into it. Uh, but we also know, you know, when we look at mode shift, um, ironically, one of the most effective uh, methods of mode shift so far, a uh, bang for the dollar, 
uh, is cycling because we get the biggest bang for the buck and more people are, are, are taking up cycling as a result of the infrastructure. And so it's, it's a fairly good success story. Uh, of course, we need more people walking. We need more people taking transit. Uh, if you look at the transit numbers, transit has a hard time growing. And I don't know why that is. And so why a flagged LRT, like many other people did, is it's a very big expense. So is there an opportunity cost there uh, from a climate perspective? That's the question I'm asking, and I think it's probably a good question. Okay, that's great. Thanks for those answers. Uh, Kimo, are you online? Kimo Man Saray? Uh, Kimo's no. not here. He's uh, not here. Oh, okay. But uh, if you have any questions generally for Africa Center, I can answer. Okay, but Emmanuel, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify, I do believe he said that for every one dollar from the city, you're able to leverage eight eight other dollars? Uh, there are about, so I can easily pull up the numbers quickly here. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to pull up the numbers for you. Thank you. Um, if you if you don't mind, I'll just move on to another question and then I'll, I'll find the numbers for you. Uh, you know what, that's okay, don't worry about it. Uh, that's it for my questions, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Prince Bay, Councillor Jans. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so much here. I want to thank everyone. I just want to maybe ask, um, uh, I'll put it to, to William or, or any anyone from the Chinatown contingent. Um, you mobilized power like I've rarely seen in this city. You had seven ministers walking with you, committing to you, giving, saying that they were going to help you. Yet, we have not had a any help, uh, not nearly enough help. How has how your how has your res response been? We've we've had a leadership race now. We have a new cabinet. Many of those people who made commitments to you are in cabinet. They have their their hands on the checkbook. Have are they coming through? Uh, thank you, Larry. thank you very much, Councillor Jans. Um, I think there's oftentimes a an idea that. Um, with politics that our community is united in how we believe and what we believe in. Um, I personally think that the CDC views uh, the way the path forward is with being inclusive and um, understanding the, the social difficulties with mental illness, addictions, and poisoning. Um, that might not be shared uh, with other people in, within our community. Um, and that, that's part of what we're talking about, right, with the CTC, is that we're creating an organization that is trying to bridge all of these differences. Um, and we believe, the city believes in that as well. Uh, so w the question about whether or not they support us, oftentimes it might be mired in other political conversations with, with their, their stance on mental addictions and, and that. Um, I, I do believe that the, that the government that is in charge right now does believe in Chinatown the people of Chinatown, whether or not that belief mixes well with their belief in how they treat homelessness um, might be in stark contrast, but um, I think their support of the Chinatown community and, and what we're concerned about is, is, um, is supported for sure. Yeah, uh, so have you had any luck in, so let's pick some areas of common ground, even, even picking up part of the police budget. Um, we're having to raise taxes, and, 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 and a good chunk of that's going to the police. Have, have you had any success getting the, the funding for police or funding for recovery beds? Um, not even safe consumption sites, but recovery beds, which they keep talking about recovery, but... Has so there's definitely leaders within our community, like the BIA is, and the CBA are, they have very strong ties with uh, the current government. Um, the CDC is working on advocating to, towards that government and to develop our relationship with them. Um, but again, I, I feel, Councillor Giants, that these questions are very complicated. Uh, it's, uh, you know, today we're here to talk about capital investments that can trigger hope for our community. 
not necessarily what is the real problem, which is houselessness and addictions and things like that, uh, which we also believe in. It needs to be focused upon, and, and we need to do a better job with advocating towards provincial government to for those supports, but so does everyone in Edmonton. Yeah, and like I used to, I, yeah, yes, um, I think the hard, oh, sorry, do, would you like to share as well? Yeah, I, I think uh, in a meeting with uh, Minister Jason Lin, uh, I, I think he talked about policy changes. So he said injecting sites, uh, he didn't think that was a good idea. So he's going to decentralize it, and then he's going to go to uh, a more, uh, 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 setting up a center that where you provide holistic support to the homeless. Because the homeless is not just because of homeless, they also have mental health issues, drug addiction, and all kind of things. So, uh, so I, I think, uh, to me, that's the right concept, but that requires policy change and also, you know, uh, change in government and also the funding and so on. Unfortunately, he got moved to another portfolio, right? But I, I believe he was, he was championing that. Uh, he truly believed in that. So, uh, uh, in terms of dollars, I, I guess, uh, I, I guess we cannot represent the city other than we only bring concerns to them, maybe from a policy perspective from the big picture perspective. Uh, I, I think maybe specifically there's some funding we could ask for. Some time ago, uh, we did ask the province and the federal government to support the Harbin Gate and they agreed to it, but they were waiting for a letter from the city, but it never was never sent. So, so I mean, yeah, we could certainly work on that too. I will, I will follow up on yep. that. I'm out of time. I appreciate Thank the Thank you, Councilor Jans. Councilor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just, um, Mr. Kwan, you had talked about the, the, the four items that you're looking for. You, you said possibility of delaying 107 AF, and then there was another one as well. Which one was that? Uh, well, 107, uh, yeah, because uh, when I look at the report itself, it says schedule for construction in 2027. Seven, yeah. So we're now talking okay. about 2023 to 2026. So I said, okay, right. I know money is tight and there are priorities. Uh, the, the other one, uh, I mean, Mary Burley Park uh, is off the roadway itself. So the critical one are really 97th Street and also the, uh, the Chinatown streetscaping uh, uh, in the Macaulay neighborhood where you are doing the neighborhood renewal projects. So I guess uh, my, uh, my main uh, uh, you know, presentation is really about if you can combine them, you, you realize savings, yeah. right? So that, that, that's where I'm coming from. Well, okay. While we're in there, we might as well do a little yeah, bit yeah, extra. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Because um, that, that, that hope does come at, at quite a price, yeah. Um, and, and I'm just wondering, um, uh, Mr. Lau, you painted such a lovely picture for us um, of what it could be. Uh, and you talked about the metrics here for um, how we're going to show how effective it is. Have you done sort of any sort of cursory consultation with, with business? Are, are, what's their reaction? Are they on side? What percentage of business? Yeah, it, it's been the one-on-ones the -on with business over a weekend that, that made me realize the need for the, the shift in, in mindset. You know, many of the businesses don't open at night um, because they, and, and they don't program at night because they don't think people will come because they think it's not safe. Um, there's only a handful that are open at night, which made engagement for the evening programming very actually e easy because there's only a few that we needed to actively benefit because there's only a handful open. Right, so we'd want to program the nodes first at Pacific Rim Mall, right, right, right behind the RAM, and then the hall block because there's about five restaurants that are open um, between there. Right, so we're quite intentional about how we want to carry out this work so we're maximizing benefit to, to the businesses. Okay. Those that are open, love it. Um, and I think through that, we want to start that, 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 that uh, behavior change to see if more are willing to open and, and, and take part in these activities. Okay, so definitely, I mean, if, if we can find the funding, it, it will help to, to reactivate the, the area. They're all, they're on side with it. Okay, yeah. all right, um, let's see, did I have anything for anyone else? I don't think, Richard Good Swimmer, is he on the line? From Ri Indigenous Sports Council? Richard Good Swimmer? I don't think so, no. no. I'll then uh, just yield the rest of my time, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Rice. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I hope my, my voice is okay. And thank you to see uh, the community and come here and to voice uh, the strong voice to how we can improve the Chinatown. So my question, uh, the first question, and 
any of you could answer this question. It's about the safety in Chinatown. And then I do understand that the, the safety is a big concern in Chinatown. So if this safety is not just or is not resolved before we are putting all this project in place. So can you tell me and how you see the linkage and how they impact and then all those projects going on? Thank you, Councillor Rice. Um, I think when you talk about safety, it's a very broad term, oftentimes used too loosely. Uh, I think in Chinatown, safety, it's about community supporting one another. Um, and that, that has been lacking a little bit. And that's what the CDC is hoping to do is to start to help bridge communications within businesses to help one another, support one another. And then you have enforcement, um, which is to protect property rights and things like that. Um, and I think safety, like of course the timing of having the Healthy Streets program is, is important. Um, but it's not, I don't think it's gonna be a direct correlation It's having a, 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 he a healthy street. I think it's, it's gonna require help from the community. It's gonna be about cleanliness. It's going to be about enforcement. It's going to be about bylaw. Um, so, so I think right now, of course, our, our community is, is scared. They're hurt. Um, there's l years of neglect and abandonment that they're dealing with. And so oftentimes, even when you, when you, when you hear about uh, Jordan Hahn's, um, you know, his, his media and his production, um, it describes a family sense that still does exist in Chinatown, and we have to change that narrative. But it's that narrative that is being perpetuated throughout media that it's unsafe. And, and so for people that are store owners and they hear this, it, it's very easy for them to continue to repeat the same narrative. And that's what the CDC is trying to do is right now we have a time where we have, we have Brett Latchford, we, we have a lot of resources, we have the CDC, you guys have funded it. We need to start to change that narrative. And I think part of that narrative is, is that Chinatown can be safe and it is safe right now. And to come out and to continue to support our stores um, so with this capital investment, I think the timing of it and all this work, it could result into a trigger and, and to, um, to continue to see more investment in Chinatown. But um, I, don't, I don't know if we didn't have Healthy Streets, if this would be as successful. I think that's, um, you know, that's, uh, that's a hypothesis, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that the City Council will believe in, in capital investments and, and see where we can take this. Um. Uh, thank you for that answer. And also, I, I heard the proposal about the Saturday night market. So for that Saturday night market, and then is there any specific why we only do the Saturday night market and then give the factor of the safety concerns, give the factor of the business right now is struggling and in Chinatown? And then give the factor of like so many other, like we talked about earlier, the concentrated social services in place and how that night market will look like and with what we propose here. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I, I would actually start by answering a little bit of your, your, your previous question. I just mindful of <laughs> my time as yeah. well. Okay, and, and, and previously, you know, you said, is, is the timing right? Well, we have a number of safety initiatives underway. If we just wait for things to, to feel safer before we do more, then, then we have a, a great lost opportunity. I think we have a chance right now to start the groundwork for br actively bringing people back into Chinatown, and that in itself will, will make it feel safer. Um, about the night market, um, we started off wanting to do Friday, Saturday nights all year round, and we realized how much work that would be. So we said, okay, let's, start, let's pick one day. And, and Saturday nights, because Friday nights, you know, people might want to get some rest after work. Um, and, and when we look at programming across the city right now, you know, um, we couldn't find something regularly every you know, Saturday night that people could go to reliably and have a good time. So we think we, we, think we have when a great I opportunity. Have, I only have 25 okay. seconds. May I, I have one more question I want to uh, put on the table. And the specific is the tax uh, impact on the business in Chinatown if this request approved. So I, I want to put that on the table and how that impact all the business, all the pe all our uh, neighborhoods in that area. And then, uh, I, I know this question may have more information from administration, but I do want to put it on the table to think about what's the tax impact on those business. Okay, my time is out. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, and Councillor Wright, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair.
So, first of all, I, I really want to commend the, the resiliency of the, the folks uh, working in the, in the Chinatown and the leadership from the community. Uh, I, uh, I don't hesitate to acknowledge that uh, uh, Chinatown, uh, Boyle Macaulay area, Little Italy have been ignored by the, by the city and by other institutions, including police, uh, for decades. And things need to change. Uh, and we made some changes. Uh, we put together that safety plan. I just want to start by asking you, is that safety plan, uh, is, is it improving the situation? Maybe not significantly, are you seeing incremental changes in safety? Maybe not? Just be honest if you are or not. Right? Yeah. Um, I think in, in terms of incremental changes, yes, of course, right when, you know, the tragedies happened, there, there was a profound impact. Yeah. Um, but just like everything, I think you heard from the police is that it was providing constraint within their own organization, that they were pulling people from other areas, doing overtime. And um, I think the Healthy Streets program is there to, to address that increase in labor need. Um, but quite frankly, they haven't started yet. Um, yeah. We don't even have an office located yet for that program. I think they're still searching for it. Um, so we're concerned heading into January in the new year that um, <clears throat> there will not be a program yet in place. Okay. Yeah. And so, you know, with, with the winter conditions and how they are right now, uh, the, the situation is becoming extreme. Yeah. And I think a lot of the businesses are scared that uh, some of these, um, these feelings can be uh, interpreted within their community. Yeah. Are some of the private security funding that was provided to businesses, is that helping a bit? Yeah, it does. I think they're they're generally regarded as the first responder. They're the first ones to see it, and then they'll report it to the police. And then, oftentimes, there's a there's a handover uh, yeah. process. Um, I know that their program is expanding as well because the need is also being seen in Kingsway, BIA, yeah. um, and Alberta Ave. And I know these programs are are being sought as as alternatives towards just strict enforcement for sure. And the and the one million dollar that was provided. Uh, as part of the vibrancy sporting businesses, right? Uh, I know it might be too early to see the impact. Well, no, actually, yeah, there's I... been a great amount of support. It's oversubscribed. Hmm. Um, okay. A lot of people have, um, I mean, maybe Alan and William can answer that. Yeah, I, I chaired the Chinatown Recovery Committee, uh, Mayor. I, I think so far right now, we have allocated half a million dollars. Hmm. Uh, we have an open house on October 20th, and uh, like we have 70 businesses show up. Their primary concern is uh, the broken windows and the security. And the confidence, so that half million uh, we have allocated to BIA yeah. to work with the business owner to provide shutters and, and some other things to, for them to gain confidence to stay in Chinatown. Okay. Because a lot of them say then things not improve, we're going to move out. So, okay. Okay. so that, that's our first step. Okay, got it. So there might be opportunities to build on that fund yeah. and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, maybe expand that fund to include other business districts because I did not know that the... Uh, I, I thought that fund was available to Alberta Avenue and other businesses, right? So it's just, I you know, I love downtown. I we need to support downtown, but I think we need to. I thought that that micro grants that are only available to downtown should be expanded to other business districts. Maybe that's something to consider as part of the budget discussion. Coming back to the uh, uh, the landscaping and other work that needs to be done, uh, uh, the the commitment was made in the, by the previous council in 2018 to fund this work, right? Uh, I, verbally, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but nothing in writing. But I think the executive committee at the time when I was there, I, I believe uh, they, they did commit to include it yeah. in yeah. the capital plan, right? Yeah. But of course, uh, I'm not familiar with the process at the time and yeah. the true understanding until, yeah. you know, uh, and we are doing quite a bit of work in the downtown core on streetscaping and uh, yeah. wider sidewalks, and this really looks pretty nice. It uh, it attracts people to uh, 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 to come downtown and helps with businesses. Yeah, I, may I take opportunity that we actually have a list of not twenty five other projects. Uh, they're more smaller projects, but yeah. not fitting the capital program. Yeah. So we we do have a work plan. We. Uh, we are actually going to hire uh, uh, someone to coordinate with us to okay. execute those projects okay. over the next four or five years. So, okay. uh, so uh, we prioritize them, and like, I know there's some funding from the city, but there are some three point seven million dollars unfunded. 
So we're going to try to apply for grants and work with the federal government, provincial government to, to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Emmanuel, do you have that number quickly on the Africa Center, uh, leveraging dollars with external resources? Yes, I do, Mr. Mayor. Can you share uh, that? That number is uh, one, we're leveraging $1 from the city for, uh, for $9. Okay, good. Thank you so much for sharing that. Good. Okay. All right. Uh, Constant, I'll take the chair back. Constant Nack. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. And, and again, thanks everyone for coming. I, I, I didn't have any questions until just the, one of the last answers you gave. I wanted to double check. Um, you'd suggested that the, the, the location hasn't even been set for the healthy streets. And I, I'm just a little confused because I remember we had a conversation in August to, and there was a sense of urgency. And, and so have you, I mean, maybe I'll ask EPS when they present tomorrow, but, but what have you heard? Because I'm, I'm just not sure why that hasn't materialized. So there's been a number of uh, locations um, that have been shortlisted. Mm -hmm. I think they were very far with, um, they're very far along with one particular location. I think the, the stick up was that um, I think the original proposition from the BIA was that this office was to be for free. Yeah. Uh, but I, for me, I think that would be more of a beat cop office, you know, a few people in there. I think as the program expanded with the deaths and healthy streets program, uh, the budget has been expanded. Um, the, the, the space requirement and the maintenance requirement is a lot different now. You know, there's vehicles and, and yard space and protection over their assets that they're looking at being underground, you know, within a fenced area. Yeah. So one by one, each has come to the chopping block and has been eliminated. Um, but there are still places that are, could be free. I just don't think it should be. I think this is, the, it's very, very well funded. Um, that there should be at least something in it for the, the landowner that t yeah. they're taking on a lot of um, exposure to their property. Of course, there's going to be people that are not happy with the Healthy Streets program and, and enforcement in that area. So um, I, I think currently right now there, there's still a few shortlisted, but that it's not yet definitive. Okay. Do, do you have a sense, have you had any sense of timeline as to when that's going to happen? I just, I, I just realized like it feels like we need to sort of I, I don't want to put that, anyone so. in a corner here, but I think even within city administration, yeah. they don't really know what uh, EPS, what their decision is yet, okay. and what that process looks that's like. Fair. And I can ask them tom tomorrow when yeah. they present. No, I, pre I just, when I heard that, it sort of jumped out at me, so I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Lau, you had turned on your mic to respond, but I think uh, Mayor Sohi ran out of time on, on one of the things. So did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, yeah. Either that or one of the previous questions. Thanks, Councillor Nack. Um, going back to you know when these decisions were first made, I just wanted to uh, point to, to two things. So the two guiding documents for us in our work is the strategy and the urban interface plan. In the strategy, one specific action, 14.1, the first one under infrastructure, is coordinate opportunities to integrate um, ancillary design enhancements with scheduled infrastructure renewals. That could include the addition of secondary power to street poles and use of color prints and pavement or asphalt. So this leveraging with neighborhood renewal is, is a key opportunity. And the other is, um, in the urban interface plan, the final page is a summary of, of all the initiatives, high priority to low priority. And high priority items, public realm improvements along Celebration Route Grid and Gateways, Mary, uh, Mary Burley Park, 97th Street Public Realm Improvements. So all these have been identified even back in 2016 as high priority, and they haven't been acted on. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Those are all my questions. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, I, I just also want to pick up on kind of the line of questioning of Councillor Knack, because my understanding from the conversation back in honest and full transparency, I did not vote yes to the Healthy Streets operation for these exact concerns that I'm, I'm gonna be raising right now. Um, my understanding was it was supposed to be uh, very much something that could be mobilized quickly in, in, in that emergency response to the tragedies that happened in Chinatown. And now when I'm hearing you talk about it, it sounds like it's being set up as a very permanent location when we don't even have funding beyond 2024 for it. Can you, can you elaborate on that? So again, I, I'm part of this is hearsay, you know, I'm, I'm okay. hearing this from my community and um, I don't want to speak out of turn. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I, and I, I appreciate that this, no, you don't need to answer the questions about EPS, but my concern is that we've, as a city invested millions in in making in providing that support to Chinatown. And if Chinatown isn't seeing that change and seeing that support, that's concerning to me from a even from a from a governance perspective. So I your your perspective on that is important to me. So 
um, to answer you, Councillor Rutherford, I think um, there's there's work being underway. I mean, the fact that you don't have a home to place it in physically doesn't mean that the work is not underway, the planning is not underway, the training is not underway. I think it is. Um, I, with, with respect to the space and its permanency, um, this is a two-year program. Uh, what we're talking about here is the size of it, not necessarily the duration of it. Um, what I'm understanding is that there's assets like vehicles, there's you know surveillance equipment, um, there's places to house people, there's there's multiple different types of organizations, EMS, um, EPS, everyone that's working through it here. So um, there's a lot to consider for those needs, right, from each one of those groups. So I don't want to speak out of turn, but I don't think this is also an easy mm -hmm. thing to just say, let's just put it in this place and it has a fence and let's go. Um, I think there's other consider considerations to um, to think about. Okay, and and I wanted to pick up on the line of questioning too of of Councillor Jans because I I understand like I'm I'm also a little bit dumbfounded about how you know you you've had the ministers there they've committed and and the the, the asks are continually coming back to the city but I don't feel that same pressure is being put on the province by the community. Am I misunderstanding that? And if so, can you please clarify that for me? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, I, I think to a certain extent I agree, and thank you very much for the reminder that we should continue to apply this pressure on the government. Um, I think uh, since the, the last announcement um, with for, for affordable housing funding, um, and since the leadership race, the community hasn't had a, um, a chance to really gather around and, mm -hmm. and, and re-approach the, the, um, the, the ministers in their, in their new positions. Um, and I think we we uh, need a chance to, to come together and update our, our asks as well since the last one has been list last ones have been granted and and I, I am excited to come back to you with more updates. Yeah. That, okay. Uh, so I'm I'm hearing I'm hearing that you know again and I understand because we're in the same position just with all of the changes, uh, but there is a desire and commitment from the Chinatown community to reapproach the the provincial government on on their on their commitments to Chinatown, whatever those are. And like Councillor Jans pointed out, it doesn't have to be, you know, if there's discrepancies in how we want to deal with things, that's fine. But there is a lot of, there is a lot of ground that I think is common. Is that correct? Yeah, if I may, uh, when we meet with the, the ministers uh, in a town hall meeting, uh, there's seven items that the Chinatown community request the province to look at. Um, so uh, I guess uh, maybe it's timely to meet with them again uh, on the progress of those seven items. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, maybe that's seven items that we can share with the city. And uh, right now we have the director of Chinatown Recovery. Certainly uh, we will work with him to make sure that uh, it seems to me there's uh, uh, kind of a lack of information back to the city council. So I, I think maybe that's something we can do to work on. So we'll, 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 that would yeah. that would be greatly appreciated, and and even just myself having the awareness of what those seven asks are, so that yeah. when I'm meeting with an MLA, I can be advocating for Chinatown too. I think that that just creates a, a way way more effective advocacy for Chinatown and making sure Chinatown gets what it's rightfully deserves. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So that concludes the questions. And uh, to this panel, and thank you so much for, for being here. Really appreciate. And uh, uh, now we're going to go to our next panel, which is panel number 10. And I'll read the names. If you're here, please uh, let me know. Just to clerk first. Heather Thomas, she's added to the next panel, right? She'll be number one, or? She's added to panel 11. 11? She, oh, to 11, okay. Yes, yeah, she's number... Got it. We'll number get to that seven, on think. panel 11. So we are no, still no, at... No, it's number eight on panel 11. Panel 11, got it, okay. All right, Val B. Hills. Can Rest. you hear me right now? Uh, who's that? Sorry. Uh, this is Heather. Are you able to hear me right now? Yes, we can, but uh, okay. you would Val not. Val Heels is not there. Sorry. Oh, Val is not here? Okay. No. Sorry. Okay. And your turn will be, won't be coming yet, right, Heather? Sorry if about that's that. That's correct. I was Sorry. Just... Sorry about that, but uh, we'll. That's okay. Uh, Judith Gill. Uh, 
Bear Clan, Beaver Hills House, joining remotely. Judith Gale. Judith Gale, no. Vanessa Keenan, the Edmonton Aurora Synchronized Swim Club, joining remotely. Here. Well, thank you, I'm Vanessa. Uh, Karambir Singh, in person. Karambir, uh, you'll be number, well, two or they'll put you in uh, any, anywhere there, right? Because we have few, we have few folks missing, but uh, yeah. Uh, Shannon Ross Watson, in person. Shannon Ross Watson, in person or remotely? Shannon Ross Watson, no. Cheryl Vest, Nova Artistic Swimming Club, in person. Okay, thank you. Brian Farrell, Jerry Forbes Center. So please, Brian. Come down. I'll come to you. Just one. Yes, I'll, I'll go through the list. Uh, Brian Johnston, Marathon Skating International, joining remotely. Brian Johnston. Brian Johnston, no. Terry Skidnuck. Remotely. Yes, here. Thank you, Terry. Jim Sandrocock, remotely. Uh, good morning, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Angela Moroz, remotely. Angela Moroz. Angela Moroz. No. Heather McKenzie, Solar Alberta. Good morning. Thank you, Heather. Alexandra. Pulwicki, joining remotely. Alexandra Pulwicki. Alexandra Pulwicki. No. Christian Fotang, University of Alberta Student Union. Christian Fotang. Christian Fotang. No. Jess Phillips. Canadian Berkey Wiener Society. Jess Phillips. Jess Phillips. No. Shifraz Kaba. Good morning. Thank you, Shifraz. Ryan Paul. Ryan, you're there. Thank you so much, Ryan, joining us. Uh, Dicky Dicamba, Dicky Dicamba from Canadian Volunteers United in Action Society. Dicky Dicamba, Dicky Dicamba, no. Brian Torrance, Brian Torrance. Brian Torrance, no. Taylor Sakura, Jasper Place Wellness Center. Taylor Soroka, sorry, Soroka. Taylor Soroka. Is she online? Taylor? Okay, we'll come back. All right. And we just had Brian number eight join. Brian, Brian Johnson. Brian Johnson? Johnston, sorry. He's on? Okay. Okay, we will start with uh, Vanessa Keenan. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm taking this opportunity today because I regret not speaking previously when the same issues arose with the Twilliger Community Recreation Centre. I am the head coach of the Edmonton Aurora Synchronized Swim Club. We are a nonprofit that has operated in Edmonton since 1981. Our home is the Kinsman Sports Centre. We are asking that the Lewis Farms facility is built as to its original plan 
and we also support continuing the CIOG. It has helped our club a great deal. I have listened to many of my aquatic colleagues speak and they were fabulous. I don't want to repeat the stats and information that you have repeatedly heard the last few days. We agree with what they've said. The aquatic community is a unified group and I haven't experienced that with other sports groups. Have you noticed that when swimming, diving and water polo talk, they always refer to it as aquatics. We are not just a synchro club, dive club, swim club or water polo club. We are an aquatic sports community. We all value aquatic literacy and we often stay involved for life. I started my aquatics journey in 1991 and I'm not an anomaly. I now work alongside other former athletes turned coaches and even athletes turned lifeguards. Did you know that the user groups in Kinsman lobbied the city for almost a decade to get the 50 meter pool at Kinsman to be switched to short course so we could get more bookable lanes? In 50 meter format, there are 10 lanes and in 24, 25 meter format, we get 20 lanes. That change helped water polo get more reasonable training hours. All the aquatics groups supported that move. That's a reason that the 53 meter pool is essential at the Lewis Farms facility. It can support many aquatic users and it's like having two pools in one. From the artistic swimming side, Kinsman no longer meets FINA standards. We cannot host a national or international competition. All the Western bids go to Saskatoon and Calgary. Our last high profile event was in 2008. I happened to see Paula Findlay from Triathlon speak yesterday. She absolutely lit up when she talked about competing in front of her home crowd. How wonderful would it be to have our young amateur athletes experience that too? I was fortunate to compete in 2000 in front of a home crowd at Kinsman. It sure was a highlight of my career. Artistic swimmers also don't have a regulation size pool to train in. The deep tank at Kinsman isn't wide enough and the Don Smith Memorial pool is too shallow. We try to go early to out of, comp out of town competition so we can try and fix our routines to compete with the other provinces that have and cities that have the full size pools. When the deep tank or DSM pool gets shut down, there's nowhere to train. When competitions at Kinsman occur, we lose pool time. I'm not sure if the aquatic sports community gets enough credit for helping with aquatic literacy. All the aquatic groups try to help kids swim. We just use their sport medium to do it. We hope that kids stay in our sport, but if they don't, they usually find another aquatic sport to continue their aquatic journey. Beyond that, water safety is something that affects us all. Everyone needs to know how to swim. We have personally applied for two larger grants to help remove barriers to our sport and to specifically help kids in the learn to train stage. In closing, please build Lewis Farm Pools to its original plan. We build NHL size rinks for minor hockey players. Let's build the first 50 meter pool and dive tank in the city since 1976. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Next, we'll go to Karambir Singh, right here in the Chamber Glad Karambir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the opportunity to speak today. <clears throat> uh, I wanna speak today about uh, cities, uh, active transportation and uh, bi bike infrastructure plan. And I'll be brief because I think you've heard all the stats possible in the world on these two topics uh, for over the last couple of days. I bike in the winter because I want to take climate action and uh, I know many others do it for the same reason. And I know that because they are friends and family and colleagues and uh, strangers who you bike past uh, in this cold weather outside. Um, but I know that even more Edmontonians want to do the same thing but unfortunately they cannot because they often complain about safety when they're biking, uh, especially when the weather conditions aren't cooperating, as well as lack of infrastructure, bike lanes and just safe pathways to be able to commute to places they need, need to go to. And so I will, like I said, I will be brief and I'll just share a uh, brief anecdote from my personal experience, what it's like to bike every day um, downtown when I come to work. In the last two weeks, I have had two close encounters being almost uh, hit by a vehicle. Um, on my way back home, I usually stop by the Commonwealth Recreation Center where I, like a good citizen, don't ride on my bike on the sidewalk. I cross the road so I can get to the other side where the roads are less busy so I can start biking again. Except that a couple of weeks ago, there was a driver coming so fast and I waited for them to stop that they didn't stop and 
when I started walking, they were far enough and I figured that they would have seen me. They didn't see me actually. And as I was halfway through the road, they figured there was somebody on the road and they had to go onto the oncoming lane so that they could skip and actually not hit me. That's not the conditions in which I want to take climate action and any other of my friends or family and colleagues want to take climate action. So I would just urge the city council to help us all take more climate action and please fund the bike infrastructure and active transportation plan so we can all do it safely and we can bike further and more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karambir. Uh, next, we will go to Cheryl West. Good morning, members of council, fellow speakers and other guests. My name is Cheryl Vest and I am the current president of the Nova Artistic Swimming Club located here in Edmonton. I'm here representing and advocating for the artistic swimming community. I'm a lifelong member of the sport from a former swimmer and coach to a now level two judge and lead executive member. My 10 year old daughter was introduced to the sport at age seven and instantly fell in love with its, its athleticism, musicality and camaraderie. She plans to pursue her dream to compete at a national and international level. In order to facilitate the training needed to achieve this young swimmer's goals, Nova Artistic Swimming is vehemently opposed to the scale backs slated for the Lewis Farms Recreation Facility. A pool that is at least and consistently three meters deep is mandatory criteria for training and competing in our sport. And the only pool in Edmonton that currently meets this criteria is the Kinsman Sports Center. Edmonton's population has grown by 300% since the Kinsman was built in 1976, yet no new training facilities have been erected to support this exponential po population growth. As you have heard, many, many athletes across all aquatic sports vie for space at this coveted training venue. With the permanent closure of Nate and Scona pools, our city's artistic swimming training spaces are diminishing instead of increasing despite a growing demand. Within the last 12 years, the artistic swimming community was eagerly anticipating the building plans of the three newest rec and aquatic centers in Edmonton. However, when Terwilliger, the Meadows, and Clairview rec centers were completed, imagine our disappointment when budget cutbacks led to none of these pools meeting the FINA standards set for training in or hosting provincial national or international competitions. Our artistic swimmers currently train out of pools that are too small and too shallow, which leads to inferior performance quality and much too often injury. I have been attentively watching and listening to the many speakers that have come forward in solidarity over the last three days to voice their opposition to the proposed scale backs. I was particularly thrilled to see world-class triathlete Paula Finley speak. Few things instill as much national pride as seen as a Canadian on top of an international podium. And the fact that Paula is a local product makes this fact even more fantastic. I think we all know what needs to happen within these budget plans to ensure that Edmonton, Alberta, and Canada can be highlighted more often on the international stage. In summary, I do not wish here to stand here and repeat any more of what has already been said Rather, I will state that the aquatic community stands in unity in our respectful request for Edmonton City Council to use a portion of the budget surplus to move forward with the big city moves as explained in the city plans and continue with the proposed aquatic facility plans at Lewis Farms. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And uh, next we'll go to Brian Farrell. Uh, is your mic on? Here you no. go. Yeah, thank go you. ahead. Thank you, thank you, your worship and councillors. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Brian Farrell. I'm the chair of the Jerry Forbes Foundation. We are the owners and operator of the Jerry Forbes Centre for Community Spirit. Think of our foundation this way. We are a charity that provides a home for other charities. The charities in our facility serve over 100,000 people in the Edmonton area. Our 93,000 square foot building currently houses 25 charities who have fixed leases and 10 more who are month to month. So we have 35 charities and nonprofits under one roof. This provides a home where nonprofits and charities can share resources, collaborate, and thus resulting in a better program delivery of their services to our city. We provide this space for no rent 
and only charge the charities their pro rata share of the operating expenses. I'll give you a couple examples of uh, how this is working out. Paralympic Sports Association tells us that what they pay in rent now is equivalent to what they had previously paid just for parking. ABC Head Start has been able to save over $125,000 in the last two years, which they're able to put into training for special children programs. Santa's Anonymous now has a permanent home. Previously, they had to pick their toys up and pack them away in containers each year and wait to see who would house them come the following uh, Christmas. Why am I here? When we did the renovations, like all renovations, we exceeded our budget. At the time, uh, the previous council, the city had indicated they would be able to help us with some more capital funding. But as we all face today, that did not happen due to budget constraints. With the assistance of the Social Enterprise Fund, we were able to obtain a loan and finish the project. We have been open since the fall of 2018. I'm not here to ask for $3 million. I'm here to ask for $200,000 a year for four years to support the overhead of our foundation. We have taken steps to start fundraising again, but truly the only way to raise funds for this centre is having people come and see the centre. It is a remarkable place, and once they've seen it, we, we feel that we'll be able to fulfil our funding needs. We have done the following in the last few months since, since the pandemic ended to get the community more engaged and aware of our facility. We were highlighted on CBC on our Edmonton. We hosted a morning coffee mixer a couple of weeks ago for the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce for over 150 people and we did tours. We had a meet and greet with 50 invited guests. Uh, again, we did tours. We had a love local market in the summer for our community uh, that was very well attended. We've also started a campaign called Radical Generosity. It's going very well. Uh, as I'm an accountant, I've provided you guys with financial statements um, that just shows all our expenses and a declining bank balance. That's sort of the way I operate, so <laughs> sorry about that. With this support, it will give us the ability to find some large donors to eliminate our debt and at the same time not have to compete with our tenants for donor funds. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for all the good work that you're doing over the last number of years. Right? We had a chance to work together on Jerry Forbes thank you, Center. Yep. Yep. Okay, uh, next we will go to Terry Skinnock. Oh, Brian Johnston. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Brian Johnson. Brian Johnston first. Okay. Sorry. Good. Right. Okay. Good, Brian. Yeah. <clears throat> Greetings, Mayor Sohi and Edmonton City Council. My name is Brian Johnston. I attended both public and separate schools in Edmonton and graduated with a civil engineering degree from the University of Alberta. Currently a registered professional engineer. I'm on the board of both Marathon Skating International as well as the Silver Skate Festival Society. And I'm an avid outdoor sports person. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Marathon Skating International Society to voice my concern about spending $127 million on utility and infrastructure upgrades at Horlock Park, as well as shutting down the park for three years. I recommend a four-year delay of this project to investigate more sustainable solutions for water and sewer projects. I've spent my career working on both traditional civil engineering projects as well such as uh, the Outlet Collection Mall and the Edmonton International Airport, QE2 off-ramps. I've also worked on and investigated non-traditional civil engineering projects in both volunteer and employment capacity. For example, I was on the 1990 Edmonton Bicycle Transportation Plan Committee, the Rails to Trails Petition, and projects, sustainable housing projects uh, through the Solar Energy Society, with Jörg and Helen Ostowski, who built a straw bale building near downtown Edmonton or downtown Calgary. They didn't hook up to the Calgary uh, water and sewer facilities because they used a composting toilet, rainwater collection, and heated the home with a masonry heater. The home of Rob Dumont, another solar pioneer in Saskatoon, has 
built, designed and built the most insulated house in Canada and is not hooked up to the natural gas grid. He's heated with solar thermal and electric hot water. To the Victoria Park Skating Oval, um, or the rink, the skating rink pavilion is heated with geothermal, is not hooked up to the gas grid. The Effects Homes and Seoul North Engineering Project is, uh, is not hooked up to the electric grid, but only the gas grid. Electric and heat were made on site by micro combined heat and power units, as well as solar photovoltaic and stored energy on site and batteries in the hot water tank. Do we really need this type of grid connected infrastructure that's being proposed? Has there been a study to see if we need this? Clearly, in the above examples, we, we may, may or may not need it. Um, the, universe, the International Space Station clearly does not need it. The joke up there apparently is that today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee and they reused all their urine to clean drinking water. Poop gets tossed up and burned in the atmosphere. Um, with the with the composting separate brand toilet, for example, urine could go to fertilized plants and poop could be burned or composted in the landfill along with the doggy poop. Do we need to use fresh drinking water as a transportation medium? Can we delay the construction and closure of Horlock Park for four years and investigate these alternative solutions? Horlock Park provides an important recreational resource. It's too important to close down for three years. It is well used by both the public and elite sports. For example, summer includes World Triathlon Series and winter includes Silver Skate Festival. Both these groups offer recreational top level sporting activities. Um, the park includes uh, activities such as walking, cross country skiing, cycling, swimming, frisbee throwing, just to name a few. The park is open to and free to the public. With just the interest on $127 million, for example, at 1%, the, the city could purchase and construct a heated garage that houses Zamboni type ice grooming equip, equipment and some light equipment so Edmontonians can enjoy skating on the pond earlier in the season. Also, with the deferred capital expenditure of four years, the city could fund its active transportation program, capital improvements to the city Edmonton Ski Club and recreational swimming facilities. In conclusion, I recommend a four year delay to research sewage and water outflow solutions and use the money to fund important recreational projects such as the Zamboni, Evans Ski Club improvements, swimming facilities, active transportation plan and solar PV, just to name a few. Thank you, Brian, uh, for your presentation and, uh, and being here with us today. So next we will go to Terry Skidnick. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm Terry Skidnick, proud Edmontonian. Most recently put on full display when Alfonso Davies scored Canada's first ever Men's World Cup goal. So a very proud moment for sure. Uh, my career for the past 20 plus years and now is in public health and wellness. In terms of that public health lens, we're understanding more and more that how we design and build our cities has a significant impact on the health metrics of people. What's the state of public health here in 2021 in terms of daily steps and getting in the recommended 150 minutes a week of physical activity? We in Canada rate a C, so that's just under half are getting to that minimum uh, amount of physical activity where there are health benefits such as reduced risk for costly chronic health conditions like heart disease and diabetes. Kids and seniors rate even lower. And that's all a, a, you know, a significant public health concern. And in terms of active transportation, Canada rates an F, and that's a reflection of the cities we have built. So something I'm not so proud of is that Edmonton is a leader in Canada in terms of carbon emissions per capita. And the biggest emitter we know is, is transportation at nearly a third. The city's 2015 household travel report says we're at about 1.8 million vehicle trips per weekday. So basically we're at more than 10 million vehicle trips on our streets every week. No wonder that our emissions are so high and drivers complain about traffic. 
again, a reflection in part of the type of city we have designed. With our population projections, if we don't start to seriously curb behaviors and reduce some of those car trips, city councils and citizens will be facing significant yearly tax increases to try and maintain the road infrastructure we have while creating critical deficits in other areas, especially related to our climate goals. I understand people want to move efficiently with their vehicles, but a misunderstanding out there is adding more roads and lanes is going to provide traffic relief and improve commutes. Those outcomes do occur in the short term, but longer term results show congestion returns as it induces more driving and it's a vicious cycle. And listening to experts like Sam Schwartz, who is chief traffic commissioner in New York City and now advises many cities like ours, the only way to solve traffic congestion is to provide viable alternatives to driving. And there is literally no other solution that works. So how can we meet our climate goals and improve public health? We need to reduce some of our sedentary car trips and increase our active transportation. We can only do that in how we strategically choose to build this city. We have a great city plan and really every decision that is made in this budget either moves us closer to achieving that plan or further away. Now back to those 10 million plus vehicle trips weekly in Edmonton, a third of those are less than five kilometers in distance. And of those millions a year are trips that are just one to three kilometers. That is such a great opportunity for us to design a city where people can integrate movement into their day. A short bike ride or a one or two kilometer walk to pick up a few groceries, go to the library, grab a coffee can give us the 30 minutes of moderate physical activity we need for health benefits while completing different daily tasks. Sadly, though, like most North American cities, we have built a place where active transportation is often very unpleasant or just unsafe. So we know that active transportation is a key way for more people to be consistently active in their lives and improve their health. And evidence shows that residents choose active transportation for utilitarian trips if it's time efficient, safe and pleasant and where there is infrastructure for it. Having places closely connected is key too. And even better, when people use active transportation, it yields similar health benefits to structured exercise programs that you'd find in a rec center or a gym. And with that, it also creates desirable communities with less traffic, livelier and safer streets, and cleaner air. That household travel survey I referred to earlier also showed that 444,000 Edmontonians have bikes. So that bodes so well if we can get a well-connected, safe bike system in place. But just know that reasons people choose for not uh, using active transportation, safety concerns, as well as secure bike parking, um, a lack of confidence in their physical ability, poor weather, but often related to safety. Please ask me about that and questions if you have any. Um, and then a lack of safe uh, a cycling infrastructure. So again, with our design and land use strategies, our municipal government has a crucial role to overcome these barriers I just noted. And we have the opportunity to make some important strides here and now. But again, how we design our city or neighborhoods is a huge influencer. So please fully fund the transportation, active transportation plan. Thanks. Thank you, uh, uh, Terry. And at this time, I would like to welcome uh, the students from Good Shepherd School, grade six class. They are here with their teacher, Jeff Fernandez, and they are represented by Councillor Hamilton Ward CP Winniwak. Thank you so much for coming to see us. Yeah. We are talking about budget. Are we hearing from public today? They are engaging with us on uh, uh, what they see our city to be in the future. Good. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, we will carry on. Next, we will go to Jim Sandercock. Uh, thank you, and good morning, uh, Mayor Sohi and Council. Uh, my name is Jim Sandercock, and my family and I live in Ward Métis. Today, I'm speaking about climate change and the shocking lack of climate action uh, in the proposed 2023-26 budget. Climate change has been described as a threat multiplier by the U.S. military since at least 2014 because, frankly, it makes all of our current problems 
even worse. It turns out that our societies were built for stable conditions, but environmental changes are rapidly accelerating, and this is undermining the well-being of our cities. As pointed out by the Edmonton Youth for Climate uh, group on Monday, uh, we are now seeing heat waves, heat domes, more frequent forest fires, uh, flood damage in the interior of BC, catastrophic monsoons in Pakistan, and buckling roads and runways in northern Europe because of increased heat. These types of changes will introduce very real and additional and significant costs to Edmonton infrastructure and program delivery by mid-century. So for thinking back to those students that we heard on Monday, their budgets, when they're sitting in your seats, will be hit by a billion dollars of extra cost. So if that sinks in for scale, that's them not being able to build three Lewis farms every single year. So when we look at this budget, my question for administration is, is where are the mitigation plans to avoid known risks? Some people have been coming in this week and asking uh, for the, for the, for the um, group to, to focus on core services. However, the city council is uniquely responsible for exercising long-term long strategy by which they can avoid the worst impacts of various emergencies. And as you've heard this week many times, this is a climate emergency and climate action needs to be funded. The good news is that we know exactly what to do to act. Public dollar investments by the city can deliver three significant benefits. Uh, the first is obvious, we can de-risk the carbon liabilities for the future. The second thing is, is we can boost public sector growth at the same time. And third, we can catalyze citizen wealth creation at the same time. So as it relates to private sector growth, through Edmonton's solar rebate and other similar programs throughout Alberta, we saw a growth of over 120 registered solar companies in the last few years. These small medium enterprises support stable, clean energy jobs. Through HERA and our very brief CEIP pilot, we've seen an increase in the amount of energy efficiency on Edmonton homes. Over 156 different companies are registered to do this work on the website and 123 of those operate in Edmonton. These again are vibrant and growing small medium enterprises which are the backbone of any strong municipality. So my question to this budget is, why does the proposed budget lack economic development plans for an industry with so much potential growth? And lastly, increased energy efficiency and renewable energy generation is also generating wealth for Edmontonians through lower energy bills, through increased equity in their homes, and with these savings, people have more available to spend directly in their community, building our economy. Perhaps most importantly though, 75% of Edmontonians indicated that they are in favor of more climate action by the city. Good incentives can help motivate them to make climate decisions for their own homes, but large financial decisions do take time. As an example of that, uh, Graziano and Gillingham showed in 2011 that solar is geographically contagious through visual normalization. That is to say, if people see solar for a while, they'll eventually get it for themselves. Anecdotally, once my family installed solar on our house, people in the neighborhood started stopping and asking us questions about it. And frankly, we still need a house like this on every block, but we just aren't there yet. Unfortunately, uh, this business as usual budget absolutely fails to fulfill any of our climate objectives. According to the energy transition plan, now was not a good time to shut down programs. To meet our 2050 net zero obligations, we cannot retrofit just 100 or maybe 1,000 homes per year. We need to do deep energy retrofits on 12,000 to 13,000 homes per year. So in summary, to meet our climate goals, grow our small, medium enterprises in the clean energy space and grow our local economy, we need a budget that first refunds the solar rebate program, secondly, expands and extends the HERA program, and third, builds out an office that can deliver a very dramatically expanded CEIP PACE program. If we fail to get a budget amended to reach our goals, we fail the 75% of Edmontonians who are asking for climate action, and we fail all future Edmontonians who will suffer from climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, next, we'll go to Heather McKenzie, Solar Alberta. Good morning. And again, my name is Heather McKenzie and I use pronouns she, her. I am the executive director of Solar Alberta. 
Solar Alberta is a nonprofit society that has been in existence for over 31 years. We serve over 350 members, including both individual solar enthusiasts and solar businesses alike. Our mission is to accelerate Alberta's transition to a just and sustainable energy future. Over the years, we have been thankful to have the City of Edmonton as an important partner on our journey. We requested this opportunity to speak with you today so that it would be made very clear that Solar Alberta fully supports the Edmonton Transition, the Edmonton Energy Transition Committee's call for Edmonton City Council to fund climate action. We too believe that the draft budget is fundamentally misaligned with the climate emergency you have declared and the commitments you have made to this cause. In particular, we have learned within the draft operating budget that all community programming within the energy transition strategy has been defunded. This community programming includes extremely impactful and successful programs, such as the home and business energy efficiency and solar rebate programs. Given that the draft operating budget proposes defunding these important initiatives, I wish to request that Council amend the draft operating budget to fund all community programming within the energy transition strategy and at the very least ensure that the solar rebate programs for homes and businesses are funded in an ongoing way. Most solar installations on homes cost between 15 to 25,000 and as such there are still many Edmontonians who cannot afford the upfront cost of a solar installation. While the federal government has established some tools to support solar on homes, without additional municipal support, solar installations remain cost prohibitive for many. The defunding of these municipal programs, these well-established municipal programs, will result in significant negative impacts for lower and fixed income Edmontonians, as most will no longer have the ability to lower their utility bills and their carbon emissions through solar installations. Please note that if the program cost of solar rebates is a barrier, the city could simply adjust the Edmonton solar rebate program for homes to target low and middle income households and or adjust the solar rebate program for businesses to target nonprofits and small businesses. These programs do not currently have an equity lens applied to them. These slight adjustments would allow the programs to continue for those who need them the most with less of a budget impact. Please also note that if the length of these home and residential rebate programs is a barrier, then the city could simply state that the solar rebate programs will be funded until such a time as a robust and inclusive clean energy improvement financing program is in place for homes and businesses. An equity-oriented clean energy improvement program, also known as SEEP or PACE, could theoretically reduce the need for rebates going forward. Yet the city has made no formal commitment to a full SEEP rollout at this time. And the earliest date that we have heard floated by city council or admin for a full rollout is 2024. With the defunding of rebates and the delay in a full SEEP rollout, it will leave at least two years with no municipal support for energy efficient and solar upgrades on homes and businesses in Edmonton. Solar on homes and businesses around Edmonton is important for a number of reasons. In addition to the job creation and economic benefits mentioned by Mel Mel Mike Melross as well as Jim earlier. First, it reduces their carbon emissions and thereby contributes to climate change mitigation. Secondly, Solar protects homes from hail and other extreme weather and as such is an important climate adaptation strategy. Thirdly, it significantly reduces the monthly energy bills of Edmontonians. And fourth, and perhaps most importantly, solar in and amongst our neighborhoods is a visible sign that Edmontonians care about climate action and as such it builds the culture that will be required for us to accomplish all of our other climate goals and objectives please course correct and refinance, refund these important climate initiatives in the community. Thank you. 
Thank you, Heather. Next, we'll go to Shafraz Kaba. Shafraj? Yeah, I'm here. Good. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> pardon me. So thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to speak, but I'd like to applaud all of the people who um, were here today and over the last two days, and uh, really particularly the members from the Edmonton Youth for Climate, uh, Juliana and Jay, who presented Monday and were pretty passionate about uh, this issue. I have spent six years of volunteer time on the Energy Transition and Climate Resilience Committee of Council, and uh, I was off the committee as of last spring so I really don't want to see this work brushed aside because we can't find the ability to fund the next stages. As stated earlier by Jacob Komar, Peter M. Rongan, uh, Daniel Griss, David Dodge, and others from the, the committee were particularly concerned about this budget. And uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, Jay Ferrosi from the, uh, the youth group uh, really spoke passionately about how this is a climate emergency we're in, but this is a building as usual budget for capital and operating spending. Um, it doesn't seem like our administration is taking the state of the climate emergency seriously. Uh, every decision must be a climate decision. And uh, next week, uh, we'll actually see the 25th anniversary of the Kyoto Protocol being ratified. We've been talking about this for far too long and not acting upon this emergency. Please, I implore you to at least fund uh, the programs that help adjust an equitable world, um, especially those that have not the resources to deal with climate risks. For example, on Monday, Mike Melross uh, from the Alberta Eco Trust Foundation mentioned the Energy Poverty Reduction Program. This program will be assisted by having funding available uh, for building retrofits, especially housing uh, for the impoverished. And uh, we can sort of see how all of this kind of fits together in a way that help us uh, develop better climate resilience, especially for those at the most risk. If you, if you recall the graph from the energy transition strategy of how steeply Edmonton must transition to a carbon neutral operation by 2040, delaying this work and effort will only make that transition hard, harder, if not impossible. And if you look at the last few years, um, Canada's worst insurance disasters through uh, floods in Fort McMurray, hailstorms in Calgary and Edmonton have totaled over $2 billion in claims and have been uh, the, the biggest disasters in all of the country. Um, investing in climate resilience programs in this budget cycle will help us be better equipped for unprecedented uh, disasters we are going to face. They are inevitable. And we've created the Edmonton Declar Declaration committing us to a plan for a carbon neutral future. And this was done when the committee of IPCC was in our city. I believe we must make good on this declaration. And I hope uh, you as city council will look at how uh, a 4% over the next four year tax increase is not necessarily the best way to proceed when we have uh, an investment to make to help us prevent greater budget challenges in the future. I hope we can work with other levels of government who unfortunately have downloaded this to you uh, to deal with, but uh, 
with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Shafaraz. Uh, next, we have Ryan Fole. Ryan, go ahead, please. Good morning. Thank you so much for the positive uh, responses that I got from all of you uh, with regards to my initial um, outreach, with regards to submitting uh, my program proposal and thesis proposal uh, for a Master's of Social Work. Um, and then I was just posing a problem. Um, <clears throat> you know, the city homelessness. Um, and this actually... Um, segues into the chamber's um, current topic of Chinatown, what happened with that gentleman uh, murdering those two people. I mean, of course, I never condone that, but sometimes there are things that, <clears throat> and I'm not condoning it, but sometimes, you know, there are health, uh, mental health issues, there are childhood trauma issues, and I'm not going to get into that just for, for sake of time. <clears throat> First, allow me to give a little bit of an introduction to myself. Of course, my program proposal I did, and maybe all of you are aware, aside from the um, onlookers. So, <clears throat> I came from a relatively, you know, middle-class family, a decent childhood. I mean, of course, you know, I had mother problems and father problems and stuff like that, of course, always. I suffered a brain injury when I was 16. <clears throat> that was, you know, I was a promising athlete, but I got side uh, street struck uh, for in terms of I decided to get involved with, you know, criminal activity. Now, this brought me into contact with the vulnerable population after university because I am an addict and I have a criminal record. So I was unable to find employment, um, shelter, etc. So I moved into a shelter in the inner city here in Edmonton. <clears throat> now, you know, with this uh, initiative that you guys are trying to take, uh, the Healthy Streets Operations Center, this is a little bit about what, you know, you know, the positive responses that I got from you guys was encouraging, but also a little bit overwhelming, because while, like, I lose my shirt trying to help, and I'm, now I'm, I'm one of the vulnerable people, so I mean, maybe it might be... Um, wrong of me to say these people, you know, but <clears throat> I lose my shirt. Like, I mean, I walk around and I mean, maybe you guys have the same um, worry. Like, I mean, <clears throat> people are living in tents. People are like, and I mean, so what do we do? How do we address this? How do we acknowledge this issue? Well, with the Healthy Streets Initiative, <laughs> see, this is what I'm saying. We're taking a top-down approach at all times. <sighs> And sometimes these people in these positions, I hate to say it, I hate to sound cynical, but sometimes for whatever reason, maybe they don't care, maybe they're jaded, maybe they have their own issues. You know how many times I have, like, for instance, ID, and I propose this to Karen Miss Tang, you know, uh, one of her um, workers or assistants or whatever, right? Sometimes these people, us, the vulnerable population now, I was raised with, you know, like I have a good cognitive ability. I have good physical capacities. You know, I mean, I have a decent childhood, you know, in which I wasn't abused physically, mentally, emotionally, sexually. I was not, I was not told every day I'm no good. I was given attention. I have confidence. But a lot of the, these people, they do not. So how can we expect them to go get a simple piece of ID, which, which we take for granted for being able to um, be, 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 be gotten, you know? They don't have phones. These shelters, and please forgive me as, again for my um, tenace, uh, tena audacity, you know, but I mean, staff members, I went into a shelter on um, Christmas Day of 2022, a staff member had her finger in one patient's face because she was going through psychosis, she was high on drugs, but these staff were untrained. We have to empower from the bottom up rather than the top down. I see social workers at FACS. You know, there's outreach workers for AHS who tell me 
Why don't I push the gentleman in the wheelchair to get it, the ID and the documentation that he needs? Well, I'm sorry, isn't that what you're getting paid for? So there's a disconnect, I believe, in what need, like millions of dollars is being thrown at this problem year after year. And I mean, there's, the, the, the situation is getting worse. And I believe we have to start at the bottom down rather than the top bottom up rather than top down in order for us to see a change because Thank these people need to be given love attention and confidence that you know there are people like you and I. Thank, Thank you, you Ryan. Thank you for joining us uh, and uh, so that is uh, the people who were here but I'm going to go through the list again to make sure that uh, those people some of those m folks might have joined us now. Uh, Val can't join us, so uh, I'll start with Judith Gale. Judith Gale from Bear Clan Beaver Hills House. Judith, are you here? <coughs> nope. Uh, Sharon Ross Watson. Shannon. Shannon Ross Watson. Nope. Uh, Angela Moroz. Angela Moroz. No. Alexandra Pulwicki. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, I'm also here. I'm Taylor. I believe I'm number just, 20 on the I'll, list. I'll, I'll come to your name just shortly. Uh, Christian Fotang. Here you are. We've been waiting for you for two days. Yeah. Yeah, you finally made it. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jess Phillips. Jess Phillips. No. Dickie Dicamba. Dickie Dicamba. Brian Torrance. Brian Torrance and Taylor Soroka, you're here? Okay, all right, I will start with uh, Alexandra Pulwicki. Great, thank you very much for, for having me here. My name is Alexandra Pulwicki and I am a member of the Edmonton Food Council uh, and I'm here to promote and kind of bring attention to the urban farms and gardens, which is an unfunded item in the proposed operating budget. It's on page 183. Um, and yeah, just a bit about this um, unfunded item. Basically, it's proposing a three-phased approach to determining the feasibility of urban farming in Edmonton and the development of an urban farming program. Um, and I think that this program is incredibly important in the city of Edmonton. Um, it's uh, for a lot of things, it, it aligns with a lot of existing city mandates that I think have been um, unattended for a little while now. Um, we at the Edmonton Food Council really see a need and an opportunity for urban growing. There's many different spots in Edmonton, many different community initiatives that are really trying to grow food locally. And this aligns really well uh, with the fresh city mandate. Um, it's directly in there. Um, talking about promoting urban farming, growing food locally, whether that be in backyards or urban lots or on city property, wherever it might be. Um, but being able to grow food in Edmonton is directly part of the FRESH strategy. It's also um, located in the Regional Agricultural Master Plan, so RAMP, um, which was just finished up, uh, was it two years ago now? Um, and there's a whole you know, section dedicated to urban farming and urban growing in the Edmonton region. So I think Edmonton, the city of Edmonton has a responsibility to uphold its part in RAMP. Um, it's also a really important part of job creation and uh, fueling entrepreneurship in the city, which I think is a, is a big part of um, yeah, the, the city's role in, in helping to improve employment. Um, I think there's a stat that something like one in eight careers in Canada are in agriculture and food industry. So being able to support primary production um, and local food in the city of Edmonton, I think is an important part of that. Um, and the other piece around job creation is that I think it's uh, incredibly important for the newcomer community in Edmonton. I've spoken with a number of organizations that support newcomers here in the city. 
Um, and there's many uh, members that they serve that are coming from other countries and they have agricultural backgrounds and they just want so badly to be able to grow food for themselves and for their community, uh, but they're not able to access land. Um, being able to farm in the city is important for newcomers who live in the city because often they don't have vehicles to access plots outside the city um, and most of their community is located in the city. So it really makes a lot of sense for them to be able to access land in the city um, to grow food for their community uh, and to provide um, food sovereignty, food accessibility, and culturally uh, appropriate food for their community. Um, I also think the urban farming um, in, in specifically complements the community garden program. It's a nice next step for people who, you know, maybe first dip their toes uh, into growing food and then want to grow it at a larger scale. Um, so I think the, that kind of development of urban farming program in Edmonton dovetails that nicely. Uh, just speaking from my own experience, uh, this past summer I was part of a, a small group of young urban growers uh, who wanted to grow food collectively in the city. We were located in um, the old Strathcona region and uh, we were able to fortunately take over an existing urban plot that's privately owned um, and had been farmed for almost a decade now by various urban growers. Uh, but this piece of land, you know, we had put in a whole, a whole summer's worth of, of energy and community organization and seeds and love and all that kind of good stuff into the soil. Uh, but now that piece of land is up for sale. Um, so the group is really losing momentum. And it, it really just kind of breaks my heart that, um, you know, we have a group of eight to 10 young people um, who really just want to grow food for themselves and for the community. And, um, they, you know, we've come together, we've done all this organization and planning, and then now it's kind of just fizzling because we don't have this secure access to land, um, even though the work was there. So kind of what I'm taking from that um, and after kind of getting more and more connected to the urban farming world within Edmonton is that we have engaged citizens who are doing the work currently. And so the big question is how will city council uh, support the people in the community that want to do this work um, and the work that's so vital. Uh, local food uh, growing is really important. Um, it's, uh, you know, urban agriculture is not just uh, big ag, you know, with tractors and crops and all that stuff um, coming into the city. It's often really um, ni like niche focused, it's diverse, it's creative, it's often community focused and focused on providing, providing food for people in the city. Um, so it's, I think, a really vital part of the food strategy within the city. Um, it's also a key part of experiential learning and product development and testing for people who want to become farmers. Um, there is a, a study that was done in 2015 that showed that two thirds of new farmers are actually coming from non-farming backgrounds, which means that many new farms who- Sorry. Many farmers... Sorry? I am so sorry, uh, your time is up. Oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't see the timer. Okay, yeah, no, thank sorry. you for your time. No worries, thank you so much for joining us, Alexandra. Uh, Kristen Fodan. Good morning, councillors, Mr. Mayor, and other panelists. I want to thank you uh, for having me and your patience for bearing with me for the last two days. I wouldn't be a student if I didn't hand in my assignment on the very last day. So, you know, here I am. Uh, my name is Christian Fotang and I'm the Vice President of External Affairs at the University of Alberta Students Union and we represent over 34,000 undergraduate students who live, work and study in the Edmonton region. In my speech this morning, I would like to focus your attention on transit safety and accessibility as well as the importance of more investments in degree relevant work experience and development opportunities for students. For many years, students have made known their concerns about feeling uneasy and unsafe while taking transit in our city. Many students have been victims of verbal, visual, and physical harassment and assault, and this issue is not unique to students. Time and time again, Edmontonians have witnessed incidents of hate-motivated attacks, and some of these attacks have occurred at our public transit stations. As noted in the Office of the City Manager's report, the rise in hazards around transit areas is linked to structural factors like the desperate lack of supports for poverty, addiction, and worsening mental health challenges. That's why we are encouraged by the Council's investments in initiatives that work to address the roots of these issues and upscale the efforts of current initiatives such as the Community Outreach Transit Team. This is why we are asking City Council to support and fund the Transit Safety Resource Stabilization. As the program describes, this service package will create seven permanent ongoing Community Outreach Transit Teams, improve the Transit Community Action Team's capacity, and dedicate, dedicate more resources to call response. We also hope to see more safety measures and COD teams available at the University LRT station, where many incidents have occurred. 
We support fixing and improving lighting in dimly lit areas and bus stations, fixing and replacing bro broken convex and quarter dome or half dome safety mirrors and stairways or pedways, which if you go down the university station, um, they're either broken or covered by graffiti. We support continued messaging that promotes bystander intervention, and we hope that the city can work with other levels of government and industry to improve cell reception in the underground station so that students can call for assistance without having to run up countless flights of stairs for supports. Yesterday, my colleague Milan spoke at length about the need for increased transit frequency, and I would also like to echo his concerns there. When asked if there was one thing about public transit you could fix in, in and around Edmonton, students reported that, ETS needs to have routes to and from places that pe people actually are going and coming from. It feels like I'm supposed to go out of my way to find a route and it should never and it should be the other way around. Routes that are useful should be easily accessible and there's never a thought um, given to trying to use a different form of transportation. When asked what makes getting to campus difficult or unsafe, one student said, the ETS routes are always delayed around my area and perfectly aligned to make me miss the LRT just as I arrive at the station making commutes to and from 30 minutes longer than they should be. At certain times in the day, it is faster for me to walk for 40 minutes from the station home than to wait for a bus to take me home. And another student said, knowing that at any moment someone could attack me and nobody's gonna help. No student should have to feel that way. These common concerns shared by thousands of students speak to the immediate need to fund and improve transit safety and delivery. I would also like to shift your attention to the importance of city investing in work integrated opportunities for students in the area. I know this is something that is often spoken at the provincial or federal levels and much work needs to be done there, but our city can also play a role in encouraging and providing degree relevant work experience for our post-secondary students. In order for our future leaders to gain the experience they need, we need to create relevant employment opportunities and Edmonton City Hall is an ideal partner to provide Edmonton students with experience in a field relative to their studies and passions and interests. By working alongside those in elected and appointed government positions, students can learn to apply their skills and mirror the professional demeanor and work ethic, work ethic vital to success. Student internships and professional employment may include a variety of options and departments, including secretarial bookkeeping and accounting, translation, document, or library services, uh, public educational services, or professional apprenticeships or interns. Student initiatives do not have to be a hassle or an extensive project. They can be simple and impactful. An example of this is the Canadian-based organization City Studio, which partners with cities and post-secondary institutions to get students, faculty, and staff involved in City Hall at their local community and some previous partners include North Vancouver, Montreal, Victoria, and Waterloo. So in closing, I would like to thank Council for extending the hearing a third day, and I know many of you all sitting up, uh, I know many of you all sitting up there with students, so you all understand what it means to have a safe and accessible post-secondary experience, but you also know the importance of having institutions and governments have your back, and so I hope Council would consider these asks and fund these measures. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kristen. And now we'll go to Taylor Soroka. Hello. Um, before I get started, I just want to say how inspired I've been listening the last couple of days to everyone and everyone who's been so engaged in every topic is important. And I think that's what makes Edmonton really special as we do see all of the diverse people coming to administration. I know this has been difficult and you're doing a great job and to council. Um, you have a tough job and I value your commitment to democracy. Um, so I'm thankful that I get to work through that democracy and speak with you today. I want to speak about the unfunded service package for the afford affordable housing property tax grant. Um, I understand in our community in Edmonton, there's significant debate as to which order of government is responsible for funding the solutions that help ensure every citizen in our city can have a home. That conversation is pretty challenging to listen to without a clear understanding of what advocacy each councillor has done independently with the provincial and federal government to engage them in funding the projects and programs that provide housing for our most vulnerable. That being said, the service package is something directly in your power that will help to maintain the current supportive and affordable housing units we have in Edmonton. 
As a low intensity supportive housing provider, the Jasper Place Wellness Center provides 24 hour support on site to our residents. The support helps our residents maintain their housing and build lives they are proud of. I want to be transparent um, as a small grassroots organization that started in 2006 um, at my kitchen table with my dad and I, we have taken on million dollars of debt to step up to the plate and buy and build affordable and supportive housing options that center on the human living inside. Yet we receive absolutely no funding from any order of government to operate this housing. And the supports, they're very costly. Um, but ultimately they're necessary because as I said before, they help keep people housed and maintain their housing, um, which in turn means they're not in encampments and they're not sleeping or living on our streets. If funded, this grant program will function to protect and maintain the supportive housing units we have in Edmonton. And that's very important for two reasons. One, as we all know, there's not a large amount of money set aside in the budget for capital about uh, regarding affordable and supportive housing. Um, and two, support, uh, providers of supportive housing like JP would not be able to carry the financial and human cost of running supported housing. Lastly, I encourage you to work with the provincial government in creating a sub specific supported housing tax rate. Um, we at the Jasper Place Wellness Center have started this conversation and I expect to see my counselors join me at that table. Um, I really value each and every single one of you and the work you do for our city. And I look forward to seeing this tax package granted. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. So that concludes the, uh, uh, the speakers on panel number 10. And now we'll go to council members for questions to the uh, panel. Councilor Jans. Wow. Um, so, Brian, I just want to thank you for coming out and sharing your, your remarks about uh, your lived experience. And uh, I... Uh, yeah, I, I I thank you for for grounding us and reminding us in the 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 bottom up is just as appropriate. I was wondering, you were just running out of time at the end. If there was anything else you wish to share? No, I mean I understand it's such a convoluted issue, and there are so many different perspectives on the issue. Um, at near the end, I mean I was saying I think there's a disconnect with regards to what needs to be addressed and acknowledged and where the money is spent, um, where it should go and where it is going. You know, like the, the multidisciplinary um, building you want to put in Chinatown, yes, it's great intentions, but I fear that that is a top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach in the sense that what we're putting four sergeants in there, 16, you know, li liaisons, and this corresponds to what I was saying about, for whatever reason, um, jadedness, you know, lack of hope. Some people at the top, they just don't care. And moreover, sometimes there's also a disconnect with that person and what that person underneath needs. So, I mean, in the little anecdote that I wrote to you guys, you know, that's, that directed me over to the city council was I spoke to a police officer and I said, look, man, what's going on with these streets? You know, people have to commit crime in order to, to survive. But if they have houses, if they have dignity, you know, maybe still there are some bad seeds and they're going to fall through the cracks. But I mean, I don't think I have to have that outlook on the world where, for instance, businesses are, giving all, are being given all this money to, uh, you know, um, counter their opposition to having businesses open. We are human beings. People should not be scared of one another. And that... Can I, can, I just want to add one anecdote. So in Calgary, they were debating their budget and one of the, the Calgary police actually said to Calgary City Council that they know there's 100 people, 100 people with addictions who are, who are stealing and breaking and doing break and enters and everything to satisfy their addiction. They're, those 100 people are responsible for 90% of the crime in Calgary. And that's from Calgary Police Service, 100 people. And so there's gotta be a better way to deal with this, to deal with 100 people 
if 90% of our, our crime is going there. And that's Calgary. I looked in Edmonton. They actually had a stat. I think it was 18 people in 2019 were responsible for, for over 900, 964 calls to the police. So I, I, I hear you. I'm frustrated. Like, adding 30 more police officers and $12 million over two years, I mean, there's got to be a better way. I mean, I don't know the better way, man. I mean, that's why I proposed that offer to you guys initially after speaking with that undercover police officer when walking down 96th Street from the Boyle Macaulay area. You know, because, I mean, I, I, I walk down, I engage, I ask questions. You know, I mean, I, I love these people. And, I mean, to see these people in such destitute means and having to, like, so, I mean... So what do we do? I don't know. I mean, that's why I sent the message to you guys, and I just was reaching out, seeing if we could get the ball rolling, you know, brainstorm. But I seriously believe that it has to do with the bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. And, you know, what well, we're paying psychiatrists, we're paying police officers, we're paying all of these means. But, I mean, if the people at the bottom are not given opportunity and empowerment, if they are not treated like they think they care, they're cared for, you know, these people are not going to want to change their lives. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're told to go do this, do that, do this, do that. When resources are scarce, you know, I mean, I try to get, you know, I try to find a place for this guy to go get ID the other day. You know, because, I mean, you need ID to get aside, I don't know about shelters, but, you know, to get into a, you know, to get a job, to get temp work, to get into the Salvation Army, to get a decent place to live, you need ID. Some of these people don't understand the logistics of how to get an ID. Some of these people lack the confidence to go and advocate for themselves. So, I mean, we're, we're putting $15 million or whatever, you know, millions over all of these I'm out of time. I'm yeah, sorry, no worries, but man. thank you. We'll follow I, up, I, I and I appreciate I, it. I hope I'm understood. Yeah. Crystal clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Jens, and also thank you, Ryan. Uh, next, we'll go to Councillor Tang. Great. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming forward and speak. Um, maybe I'll just start with a quick one to Christian. I love City Studio. Where is U of A at with City Studio? You know, beyond some separate on one-off conversations I've had with professors. Yeah, I'm, I don't know either. Okay. Um, part, part of it is that I, I had the opportunity to have a chat with the founder and CEO of City Studio, and he said that oftentimes what helps build momentum is initiative from the municipal governments. Because if the yep. universities and institutions don't see buy-in from the city council, then they're not going to budge, right? So I think they're yeah. kind of waiting for the move, basically, the ball's in your part to... No, to, that's to great. And I, you know, any, any kind of in, internal conversation you can continue, I think that will be great. And uh, you know, flagging this for our post-secondary uh, team that's working on this. Um, uh, Terry, if you're still online, uh, you had asked, uh, you had mentioned, uh, you know, uh, ask you about the safety measures. So if you want to have anything to add to that, um, it was pertaining to just the weather, and that's certainly an argument sometimes used to. Um, uh, make you know against investing as much in active transportation like bike lanes uh but i just certainly we know that within winter that driving goes down people don't feel as safe so driving goes down walking also goes down a little bit more than driving but it, just to make the point in winter thousands tens of thousands of people are walking it's not that we can't bear the cold it's that there's no safe options to ride our bikes in the winter so it's not that people can't be outside in the cold people are walking all the time that in itself is also a lot oftentimes unsafe yeah thank you so much for that reminder about the importance of built environment um for um uh, uh, for brian um i was wondering if you can clarify just um um i I was trying to catch all the notes, but I think I may have missed the part about the city commitment uh, and kind of what happened there with Jerry Forbes. Um, well, when we, we had a commitment from the city and we thought we were going to receive an, an additional $2 million in capital funding. And Sorry, and this is back when? Uh, probably 2008. And at that time... No, it wasn't. Two th it was uh, 2018. Sorry, it was uh, a previ the previous council, and I had met with all the councillors, and uh, we had met with the councillor for our ward. I'm not going to name names, and we had uh, come to an agreement. Uh, we thought uh, to get some capital, more capital funding from the city, 
and it and it and it didn't happen. And I appeared at one of these. I've, this is my third one of these I've appeared at. We've never asked for operating money before, um, and we, we found the capital elsewhere. We so have to so it. now now you're letting go of that capital ask, and you're really just focusing on that two hundred thousand per year for four years operating ask. Exactly. What, okay. what, what I'm, we're looking for some certainty. I mean, um, I'm hoping we can raise the money, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I was going to come and ask for a backstop of $200,000 a year, and I don't know if, if, if that's a reasonable request. If, if we can raise the money, um, we, we, we certainly don't need it. Uh, but um, right now, our, the foundation, the small foundation, has supports so many different charities. I don't want to put that at risk. So I wanted to do some long-term planning in terms to just to make it financially secure. No, that's to be great. Quite honest with you. Yeah. That's that's yeah. clear. Thank you very yeah. much. Yes. Um, and I just want to uh, turn to Ryan. Uh, thank you very much for. I'm 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 glad you showed up in person. And I want to just really validate what you're saying. Absolutely, we need bottom up. And I think there are um, ideas, and there's so many ideas coming from people who are living it, living that life every day. Um, but I don't feel. Um, uh, it really gets the time of day when we're so focused on the top-down policies you're talking about. Um, I don't have a question for you, but I do want us to say your point about ID is so on point. Uh, there's an American city, Durham, North Carolina. City staff actually focuses specifically on getting driver's license for people who are um, just released from prison for reintegration back into society, and they've identified driver's license is the single most a biggest barrier for their reintegration. So they do whatever they can to get their driver's license so they can live their life um, um, as a contributing member of the, of the community. And so I wanna thank you for, for highlighting that and I wanna share with my colleague that that's a, that's a city work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Tang. Uh, Councilor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question is for Alexandra Polwicki. You had mentioned about uh, urban farms and gardens and access to land. And yesterday, Dustin Badger had also mentioned it. And he said that that is the greatest barrier, is access to land. So my question for you is, would you see um, land such as surplus school sites as ideal location because it's within communities? Uh, what was that type of land, surplus? School sites. Oh, school sites. Um, yeah, I mean, it really could. Um, the, I mean, I guess I don't know too much about different types of land uses, but basically what farmers need is stable land access, and then the rest can really be sorted out. Uh, the hardest part is short-term leases. So if, if farmers can't come in and know that they can invest in that place um, and build the soil up and build relationships with community members, uh, then everything else is just really hard to do. Um, there are examples from other cities that I think are really cool to highlight. Um, even City of Calgary has a, has a strong vacant lot program um, where they take turf areas that aren't being used um, and hand them over to nonprofits and community groups. Um, and they really do have a thriving urban farm scene. There's examples from City of Guelph. Um, in Victoria and Kelowna, they're leasing land to to farmers as well through the land matching program with Young Agrarians. So, yeah, that, that land access piece is key. So thank you very much for bringing that up, Councillor. Okay, thank you. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm just going to also go, go to Brian. Um, and just, again, thanks for, for being here today. And I want to echo the Mayor's earlier comments around uh, just the good work that you're doing. Um, really, really value that and recognize you're filling an important gap. Thank you. So, yeah, knowing, knowing a bit of the background here, uh, I guess I'm wondering, can you elaborate on you know, what, what would happen if, if you don't have that surety or at least a backstop at this point? Well, I mean, we, we will continue to, to try and, ra and raise the funds, right. but, you know, we're, we're, we're moving forward. We're, we've re-engaged is the main thing we've been able to do to, with the community, with, with the opening of, of the centre and the, and the pandemic being over, hopefully. Um, so ultimately, if you're looking at a worst-case scenario, you're asking me as an accountant, I'll give you one. Um, <laughs> uh, what happens ultimately if, if we can't uh, pay that mortgage? Um, ultimately, the city is yeah. on the title behind yeah. that. The city becomes the owner of, yeah. of our site. Right, right. 
yeah, okay, that was my understanding as well. Thank you for, for making that clear. Um, great, that, that's enough clarity for me. Um, and then uh, just, I'll go to, to Heather McKenzie. Uh, is she still online? Hi, Ashley. Okay, my, fantastic. Uh, Councilor Salvador. Ashley's fine too. Um, so you pointed out that there is sort of a gap here. Um, if we were to move forward with the full implementation of the Clean Energy Improvement Program, uh, you mentioned earliest would be 2024, and I think that program is really exciting, huge potential, uh, but there would still be that one year interim period. Is that correct? So you would, you would be advocating for um, sort of the community programming to continue in an interim fashion, is that correct? Not exactly. So I actually believe Council should roll out a full seat program as Calgary is currently doing now. And I think council could use this budget as an opportunity to launch that immediately. I don't think you have to wait until 2024. I think that's just what administration has told you. Um, I think you could move very quickly. In fact, there are nine or 10 municipalities across the province that are doing a full rollout. You are actually the only city that did only a pilot program. And so a full rollout is entirely possible. And as Mayor Sohi questioned at the executive committee recently, um, you know, the money to fund a seat program is not considered part of your debt. So you're actually able to move forward on that very quickly. But what I'm suggesting is given that there are always going to be some inevitable administrative hurdles to overcome in scaling up a program, it is imperative to leave the rebate programs in place until that program is full and robust. Otherwise you have a significant gap and that's highly problematic for uh, equity deserving individuals. Right, okay, well thank you for that clarity and um, just for, for my own understanding, uh, I, can, I can share that when it comes to the full implementation of SEEP and the full scaling up of SEEP, uh, the one limiting factor funny enough and, and frustratingly uh, is our tax system and being able to upgrade that to actually have the capacity to support a seat program. Um, so I was happy to see that uh, that is included in the budget so that we have all the pieces in place to scale up as quickly as possible. Um, but I appreciate your, your thoughts on that and uh, yeah, I'll be following up on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Salvador. So we are at 11.58. <laughs> we'll take a break because uh, 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 lunch break and we will be back at uh, 1 p.m. And we have shortened our lunch break for half an hour. Uh, so until then, we will be on the recess. See you at 1.
Okay. One, two, three, four. Okay, well. All right, I would like to call this meeting back to order and do a roll call. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Principe. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Paquette. Hello. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. All right, Councillor, uh, who's next? Salvador. Hello. I just closed my eyes. <laughs> Councillor Cartwell. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Councillor Jans. Good afternoon. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Next is Councillor Rice. You are next. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So he, I have some questions already asked by my colleagues. So I just going to ask if you not I'm not asked yet. Uh, the first one I'm going to ask Miss West. So I'm not sure. Are you still online there? Yeah, Cheryl. Cheryl West. West. She, Cheryl West. Um, Cheryl Vest, um, she called me, she's the other artistic swimming club and she, um, she came off a night shift. So she went home to bed. Um, she said I could try and answer the questions. Um, if any came for her. Okay. Uh, that's great. Uh, I do have one question to come to just uh, confirm uh, what I heard from her presentation is about, um, for cities existing facility recreation center. And the most of them uh, do not meet the standards for the national and the international and for training and the competition. Um, I just want to get a sense and do we still have a fee to meet those standards or we don't have at all? Yeah, we don't have, so we have to have at least 12 by 12 meters that are three meters deep, like 12 by 12 um, area but then it has to be three meters deep. And the problem is then on top of that, you have to have a pool besides the competition pool that also has access to three meters deep. So the deep tank at Kinsman is deep enough, but then when we use the other pool as a warm up pool, it's too shallow because that pool's only two meters deep. Okay, so that is uh, one of the reason why we try to push the Lewis Farmers swim pool to meet those new standards, not new 100%. standards. Yeah, correct. It's just a common standards and yes. to provide that capacity and for our Edmontonians and the specific for some clubs to have the training opportunity and also for the competition at national level and international level. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's correct. Wonderful. That is the first question. So the second question already answered. The third question. Third question, I would like to go to uh, Christine and the University of Alberta. Here. So you are here. Uh, great. Um, so I do hear and you request some uh, increase uh, for the student access to our CAT team and from city and also to put more safety measures specific, specifically for public transit at University Station. And I know at University Station we already know and there's some incidents already happened. Um, do you mean the existing uh, services city provided and then uh, from car team, car team, car team and also safety measures is not enough? That's that is what you are asking, or is there any other sense you are asking? So I, tr I try to get a sense it's clear. Yeah, of course. So what we're clarifying um, was, yeah, maintaining the investments in the COTS team, like making sure that goes beyond um, a certain number, beyond multiple years, um, but also in um, fixing some infrastructure issues around that station. So like we mentioned, the quarter dome safety mirrors are either broken or have graffiti all over them, um, fixing lighting issues. I mean, escalator, escalator repairs are always happening on that station. Um, so we thank, you know, the city for that. And the other thing that I forgot to mention that I thought was also very important, um, just 
due to lack of time, is that we just got a recent survey that said over 200 University of Alberta undergraduates live in unsafe places like cars, abandoned buildings, and since they became students, and at least 400 have slept on campus because they had nowhere else to go. And I know a lot of people have spoke about the importance of affordable housing, uh, but we especially want to support a lot of those calls for you know building affordable, mixed, non-market and emergency housing, uh, like the proposal for the uh, Jasper Place Wellness Center, okay. um, recognizing that LRT stations are not acceptable solutions to the crisis that unhoused Edmontonians are facing. Okay, uh, wonderful. So if you could follow up with me for more details, I will be happy yeah. to chat more because I, I'm mindful of my time. I have one more question. Uh, thank yeah. you very much for that. So the last question is go to the terror uh, struck. Hello. Yeah, so wonderful you're there. And then specifically for the um, unfunded tax uh, package grant, um, is there any specific reason for those type of uh, affordable or supportive housing unions not get the tax relief from provincial uh, government? As to why we haven't, is that the question? Yes. Um, I'm not sure. In the historically, the city of Edmonton has functioned using an exemption, which has um, not cre in itself made there was an exemption. So we didn't need to have the province step in. Um, once you, the administration and the city moved towards the grant program, we did engage municipal affairs and have an ongoing conversation with them of what we think would be best um, for how that should function. We think there should be a specific tax rate for supported housing providers. We want to pay taxes. We want to contribute, but we want our work as supported housing to be valued in that. So for instance, the city of Vancouver for every $1,000 assessed value, the supported housing providers pay 15 cents for every $1,000. So we're contributing, that's a goal for us. We know our residents also wanna contribute, but have it also value what um, we bring to the table that also creates a form of sustainability for providers. So in budgeting and creating new projects, we know what to expect um, based on the assessed value. Okay. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Thank you, Thank you, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. <laughs> Mayor. And, and then. It's okay. It's okay. All right, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I see that Mr. Singh isn't here in person anymore. Is he online? Yes. That's Karambir? Yes. Karambir Singh, are you online? I don't see his name, but if he's under no. some other yeah. alias, okay. Okay, um, and then was there somebody else that was talking then about the um, the bike lanes? Was that... Mr. Skidnack? Uh, I think uh, Terry talked about bike lanes. Okay. Terry Skidnack? Sk yep. And Terry, are you online? Hi, yes. Hi, okay. Um, I just wanted some, some sort of clarity. Um, because I, I've gotten emails from constituents and that saying no bike lanes. You know, people, there's not that many people that ride bikes in the city. Um, but the act of transportation, that's, that is more than just bike lanes, isn't it? Absolutely, it uh, definitely provides an opportunity for for other all all forms of active transportation, whether that's scooter, uh, you know, skateboards, and mobility devices, um, you know, aids in that sense. So, absolutely. Okay, so it 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 would touch a a, a wider range of of Edmontonians than than just just cyclists, right? Absolutely. I think that speaker yesterday, actually, uh, I believe a, a, a physician talked about, you know, even even terming them, you know, as people lane, so to speak, uh, is a good approach for that. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for that clarity. Um, and then Mr. Farrell, uh, with the Jerry Forbes Centre, I, I think that's a, an awesome model, the way that you've brought all these volunteer groups together and, and how they uh, reach everybody. I'm, I'm just wondering, you've mentioned 25 charities. Is there room for more? <laughs> No, not right now. We're okay. full. We, we are we're we are full. Okay. Which is a good thing. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. So, um, if an other organizations wanted to come together as well, they'd have to find someplace else, right? Well, I think we have sort of a waiting list, and we know the people that want to come. And then, it's been tough for some of the charities in the past year. They've struggled a bit, so we're not sure. You know, one or two may drop off. Okay. So w w we will fill up very quickly. Okay. And then, um, so that $200,000 a year, that's, is that to help service and, and pay down some of that debt that you incurred? Just to service. Just to service? Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And 
looking forward to being out there on the 17th for Santa's in honor. Okay, um, great. And um, Ms. Polwicki, um, talking about the urban yes. farms. Um, I think yes. in your presentation, I think you left off talking about um, experiential learning opportunities and that. Did you want to continue with the rest of my time on your presentation? Yeah. Or? Thank you very much, okay. Councillor. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring up the fact that um, urban gardening spaces are exceptionally important for providing experiential learning for students, for people who are learning to grow food. Um, having these spaces close to home and being able to go there frequently and throughout the seasons, I think, is a really important part of being of, of food literacy, really, knowing where your food comes from, understanding, you know, what it feels like to plant a carrot seed and then three months later actually pull that carrot from the ground, you know, wipe the dirt off and eat it um, is, uh, I think, a really transformative experience for a lot of people. Um, and often it's, it's something that can only happen in cities um, because of that proximity piece um, and being able to visit it often. Um, so I think, yeah, just being able to bring those experiences to people um, of diverse, uh, you know, backgrounds and, um, you know, locations, I think is, uh, is a really powerful thing. Um, I also just think that urban farming, at least funding this unfunded item to explore the idea and provide a plan for urban farming um, is really a low risk item um, and kind of a feel good thing. You know, people can um, come together and grow food together, build community and uh, have really healthy, nutritious food. Uh, so I don't know. I just think it's a really important thing for, for council to consider funding uh, that I think would bring a lot of benefit to, to Edmonton. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And and that so that 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 learning opportunity that sort of comes with the package as well. It's not just giving people the land and go say plant your seeds. Good luck. Yes. <laughs> oh. Yes, absolutely. I mean the the urban farms that I know of in Calgary that have been supported by the city are actually farming on city owned land. Um, their mandates are are about engaging with community members. They are operational farms but they're nonprofits and their goal is to grow food for the community and involve the community in growing the food. So that, that learning piece, that connection piece, um, that connecting to the land, to each other is, is inherent in urban farming and uh, really aligns well with how urban farmers see uh, food and farming. Whoops, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Maybe Alexander, Andrea, if uh, we can just continue. You know, we've been having this conversation for years, and for a little while, it looked like Edmonton was going to be leading the way. So what happened? Yeah, great question. Um, there was the urban vacant, or yeah, the vacant lot pilot program, I believe in 2018. I remember it uh, intimately. <laughs> yes, um, I wasn't actually living in Edmonton at that time. Um, I'm a bit newer here, but from what I hear of that program, it um, was very well intentioned and I think, you know, really started off the momentum, but there were, you know, the devils in the details, as they say. Um, so the, the challenges in that program that I heard was that um, the, the length of the lease, uh, so how long people were able to stay on that land, there was a big sticking point. Um, so, you know, the, with the current, with that iteration of the project, people didn't know if they were going to have the land three months later. Um, so it's very hard for people to, to actually want to invest in converting um, turf into um, fertile soil. Uh, so the length of the lease was a big, big concern. The other concern was access to water. Uh, many of the proposed sites were far from um, were far from water access. And so it became very prohibitive for people to actually bring in water uh, to be able to water the, the crops. Um, so I think those, I mean, those are details of that program. And I think if the city funds this urban farm program, uh, plan development, whatever you might want to call it, uh, I think really engaging with people who are farming could easily solve any of those little things. Um, people who are growing food in the city know what they need, um, know what their barriers are. Um, so engaging with, with people who are growing food and organizations that support them, like young agrarians, um, would really, I think, make that process really smooth and ensure that people um, have success in these projects. I mean, we, as, as I kind of mentioned earlier, we have community members um, that are willing to yep. step in and work on this. That's perfect. Thank you. I wish I could let you just talk uh, all day, but I have limited time. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, Thanks, and we'll get to that. Let's get rid of those details so we can get rid of that devil. Okay. So um, is, is Ryan still here? 
Uh, no, Constable Briquet, uh, he left. Okay, all right. Talk about double in the details on that issue. Uh, maybe Jim, uh, you'll, you'll have to remind me, I can't remember. Jim you were Sand talking about the environmental aspects. Jim Sandercock? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. So Jim, one of the things that we're hearing, and this ties into the urban farms, it ties into the response to houselessness and homelessness, and, and it ties into everything that you were speaking about, and that is that there are a lot of people who are saying, listen, the city's got to get back to basics, core services. And look, I agree. But how we define those things, I think, is really incredibly important. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that about, you know, our humanitarian concerns, our uh, future forward concerns, our sustainability concerns. Are these not core services? Well, my I think one of my arguments is that they are core services. Uh, in particular, the climate one is a massive risk. We know it's coming. We have had reports analyze and uh, you know estimate what the impacts will be, and it's going to make homelessness that much worse. I mean, we we were walking around handing out water on the streets because like frozen bottles because people were in very dire straits when we got a couple of the last heat waves that we've just never had before. So that kind of thing is going to happen way more often. Um, so there's there's definitely crossovers between the climate effects and what's going to happen to people that are homeless, for example, and, and other strains that we have on the system. Um, we need to be able to start looking at more cooling and not just not just heating in the winter, but cooling in the summer uh, for people who are living on the streets. So to the degree that we can decrease our carbon emissions we can do our share of reducing how much we're warming up the planet that's most definitely going to impact those budgets later on for youth that will be the adults sitting in your chairs in mid-century and they're going to be not thankful if we give them a budget this time around that doesn't do anything about climate at all doesn't give us any leadership on climate throws our reputation down the drain as it pertains to the 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 uh, Edmonton Declaration, et cetera. And so, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of crossovers. Well, thank you for that. That's, you know, that's really good to hear that uh, that is the attitude that's prevailing. Uh, yeah, thank you to all the speakers. I wish I had time to ask all of you questions. Uh, I really do because it's all so interrelated. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, with the last thing I think I would mention uh, is that, um, we know what it's like to have a constrained budget, but one thing that Chief McPhee has told us is that we can't police our way out of crime, and I don't think we can react our way out of our current circumstances and things that we know are coming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Wright, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. I'll start with the Shifraz. Are you still there, Shifraz? Yes, I am. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank you for your... Uh, uh, six years of service uh, as a volunteer helping city uh, develop the uh, uh, the climate change uh, policies. Really, really appreciate that. And I, I think we do share your frustration on uh, next steps, right? So uh, just wondering if you quickly highlight what are the top, you think, out of the action plan or out of the unfunded service package, and say top five things that you would prioritize on climate change? Oh boy. Um, well, the very, very top item is to allow the work of the Energy Transition and Climate Resilience Committee, as well as uh, administration that is sort of assigned to that to continue its work okay. and to continue with mapping our carbon budget. Because as we have said over and over, every decision has to be a carbon decision. So that goes for almost everything that has been presented today and over the last two days of, of how we make decisions and what we put forward, uh, both in capital and operating and how it aligns to reduce emissions rather than carbon locking in further emissions okay. that will never recover. Uh, the second is, is probably, like I mentioned in, um, earlier, trying to fund uh, the opportunities that help the most disadvantaged people okay. in our communities. So how do we uh, look at the programs in the energy transition that help, uh, you know, as, as Michael, uh, sorry, as Mike Melross pointed out, um, with energy poverty, how do we start to retrofit affordable housing? How do we help uh, the aspects where we know 
people will feel the brunt of very cold weather as we're, as very hot weather. And that helps us look at uh, sort of a energy um, or a retrofit accelerator that we have to look holistically across the city at what buildings, what opportunities there are to make work. Obviously, the bike lane and okay. the uh, the ability to create more active transportation um, uh, modes to again uh, service people who don't have cars and and I think again that helps um, us realize we we are even a bikeable city in the winter if we are enabling bike lanes and and the safe mode of, of uh, Transportation. I think those are my top three. Okay. Uh, you can think of other two. Well, maybe. Okay. Well, are... maybe we can follow up offline on uh, yeah, rest of stuff. On, yeah. On the uh, and to Brian uh, uh, on the uh, Brian Farrell. Uh, so two option you're putting. One is either two hundred thousand grand for over uh, each year for four years, right? Yes. Or uh, or some sort of uh, loan that could be repaid back. I really wasn't looking for a loan. Yeah. I, was, I was looking for a backstop. Oh, backstop, okay. B backstop, so if we don't okay. raise the money. Okay, I, I, I see, okay, okay. Then, what do you then mean? I don't have to risk got my got little it. charity to affect 35 other charities. Okay, got that's, it. Okay. That's all I'm looking for is got some certainty. Okay. No, thank you for that clarity because I understood it different other ways, okay. so that's good. Okay. Uh, and, and thank you for the good work that oh, well, uh, you, you you're doing. Right. Yeah. And uh, to uh, Taylor, uh, Soroka. So I understand, if I understand it correctly, uh, with the grant that the city is proposing to create, if we approve that, you would only get the, the grant equivalent to the municipal property taxes that you pay, not the provincial share of property taxes. You would still have to pay your share. City would still have to collect the province's share from you then remit that to the province. Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure that that was, that was clear. Okay, good. All right, thank you so much. Uh, those are the questions. Oh, one question to uh, uh, Christian. Um, thank you for talking about ETS safety, Asri, because uh, I'm really worried that uh, all the effort our administration has put into uh, improving safety on transit, that if we are unable to tackle uh, the issues of uh, shelter capacity because people are, we are seeing close to 150 to 400 people every evening and night that are uh, at LRT stations that they need to be uh, asked to leave, right? So uh, uh, is that what you're seeing at the, uh, at, the, at the university station as well? Yeah, certainly for a lot of students when they're going up and down the stations, they, they are seeing a lot of houseless folks, um, you know, finding shelter in those areas. But again, is 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 that the most sustainable or correct way or human no. way um, to take care of these people? Absolutely not. And students understand that. Like, I, I think there is that perceived lack of safety because they are there, but it, it's not their fault. You know, they're, they're looking for a place to stay warm. So, yeah, yeah, good. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'll take the, I'll take the chair back. And so that concludes the questions on panel 10. And now we go into our final panel, right? And panel 11, see you, Brian. Uh, and I will uh, read the names. Uh, Kevin Campbell, Little Bits Therapeutic Association. Kevin Campbell. Kevin. Kevin. Nope. Govin Timsina, Multicultural Health Brokers. Govin? Govin, are you there? No. Rispa Trombley. Rispa Trombley. No, Rispa Trombley. Okay. Christina. Rizueski, Rizueski, Christina Rizueski, or Krizueski. No, all right. Enrico Lozoi, Enrico Lozoi, no Enrico Lozoi. 
Heather Thomas. I see Heather, you're there. Here, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'll come back to you in a, in you. a minute. Paul Sir, Alberta Basketball Association. Paul Sir. Paul Sir, no. Lenny Chudik. Lenny Chudik. Civic Service Union 52. Lenny, no. Karen Gingras, she has already spoken. Karen has already spoken. Mark Eady. Mark Eady, Elder Grove Community League. Mark Eady. No, Mark Eady. Dale Conrad, Northwest Edmonton Seniors Society. Dale Conrad. Dale Conrad, no. Alexandra Pulwicki has already spoken. Neil Carey. Neil Carey. Neil Carey, no. Val Vihiel. Val Vihiel. Vihiel, sorry. The Best Friends Society. No. Judith Gale, Bear Clan, Beaver Hills House. Present. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Judith. Shannon Ross Watson. Shannon Ross Watson. Shannon Ross Watson. No. Angela Moroz. Angela Moroz. Angela Moroz. No. Jesse Phillips. Jesse Phillips. Jesse Phillips. No. Dickie Dilcomba, Canadian Volunteers United in Action Society. Dickie Dilcomba. Dickie Dilcomba. No. Brian Torrance, Jasper Place Wellness Center. Brian Torrance. Brian Torrance. No. All right. Okay, now we go to our first speaker, Heather Thomas. Thank you so much for waiting, Heather. Go ahead, please. Hi, thank you so much for being patient with me during my technical difficulties. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I was here all day Monday with two of my colleagues who presented in panel four. Um, my name is Heather and my journey with Breast, Breast Friends uh, start, began in uh, 2016. In 2011, I received my breast cancer diagnosis, and I was living out of town at the time. I said, I didn't say ever, why me? I said, why not me? One in eight women every year are diagnosed with breast cancer. My best friend had it. My sister had it. And I thought it was a really beatable disease diagnosis. And I wasn't even aware of those that weren't not beating it at the time. So I just thought, if I can get a cancer, this is a good one to get. So because I was out of town, I um, started looking for a place to stay for my treatments. And I discovered Compassion House, which is a beautiful, wonderful place for people to stay, for women to stay who are undergoing um, uh, treatments of any sort for cancer. Um, five years later, Compassion House uh, had hosted a spring retreat for previous guests. And I, I, I attended, and now I'm local, I attended... Um, with two of my friends who were from out of town, um, I, I saw that one of the presentations was um, for dragon boat racing. And I'm like, I had no idea what a dragon boat was, not a clue. And um, at, at, when they started presenting, there were two ladies and one of them was in her seventies. And I was just amazed at how fit she looked. And they, they just, I was just riveted and I was sitting on the edge of my chair. The ladies told us about the sport, how their team trained, how they traveled and the camaraderie that they developed. And I was completely sold. My family is very busy. We, they bike, they ski, they hike. 
um, and run. And I, I do join them in that. But now I have Breast Friends has kept me active and given me a sport to keep me busy. And I've had so I've gotten so many good friends um, on the team. And there's nothing, you know, there's nothing equal. I think keeps me honest because I don't talk myself out of going to the gym anymore. And there's nothing equal to getting out on your dragon boat on a beautiful Saturday morning uh, on the wonderful North Saskatchewan River Valley. It's just amazing. Traveling with breast friends to dragon boat festivals and participating with other survivors is inspiring not only to me, uh, not only to the survivor paddlers, but to all the teams and all the people watching the events. Breast friends has enriched my life and has certainly been my silver lining diagnosis for breast cancer. I wanted to share with you um, our logo and um, explain the meaning of it because it's kind of cool. Um, this is a purple bee and it represents the different sizes of breasts that usually happen when you've had breast surgery. So one's smaller, one's larger. Then we have um, the uh, breast cancer symbol and then the in, in pink and then in the teal is our boat or a, a dragon boat. So I just wanted to say thank you for um, the past CIOG funding. It's kept it an affordable team for people who just don't have the same income as others. And hopefully future funding for us and all the other worthy people that I've heard presenting over the last three days. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, oops, sir. Can you mute yourself, uh, uh, Heather? Good. All right. Next, we have Judith Gale. But Judith, just give me 30 seconds, because we have a school coming in, and I want to acknowledge them before uh, students. We have students coming into the chamber hall. I just want to acknowledge them before I come to you for uh, your remarks. OK, just give me 30 seconds. Okay, we have with us a grade six class from Mayukaman School. And they are here with their teacher, Mrs. Megan Davies. And your ward representative is Counselor Tang from Ward Gary Heo. Yes, your counselor. Nice to meet you all. Nice to see you. I hope you're enjoying your uh, your visit to City Hall. And today we are in uh, last day of our non-statutory public hearing, uh, engaging with public, hearing their thoughts on uh, uh, how we continue to build a great city for you. Okay, thank you so much for being here. Now I will go to Judith Gale. Please go ahead, Judith. Hello, good day all. Uh, thank you for uh, having me today. And I'd just like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory. Uh, so Masi Chohai Hai for their generosity for uh, allowing us on their lands. Um, so today I have a few uh, things on the agenda that I'd like to talk about. And in particular, um, uh, the number one thing that I would like to talk about is the uh, peace officers um, allocation of the budget. So um, one of the things that I believe, um, in my opinion, is that we have to have uh, the peace officers there for sure. Um, they're part of our society. But we also need to treat them the same as we do uh, the EPS, and we have to have a governing body over them. Uh, currently, the way it stands, there is no um, uh, good process uh, to um, put in a complaint uh, towards the uh, uh, the way uh, the peace officer conducts 
tax uh, their business um, with our public on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think um, that's very problematic and that allows um, for uh, burnout on the job and, you know, it's, it's harder to identify um, which uh, human being has to take a break, you know, uh, because let's face it, we all, we all have to take a break once in a while, right? So um, uh, that said, uh, that's one of the things where I think that um, the money um, that's allocated to them, instead of going towards new equipment, let's put it towards a, a good governing body that's going to um, uh, watch over um, the day-to-day uh, -day, you know, business of the peace officers. And also, I, I believe that we're going towards the budget is going towards too much policing. You know, um, we don't have enough heart, in my opinion, in the budget, and it really reflects it, uh, considering that we have so much money going towards policing. We have to um, uh, shift from that to human beings and take care of our brothers and sisters in a better way. Um, in the Indigenous community, we like to say that uh, we have three ears we have two in our head and one in our heart. And that's really where I implore uh, the mayor and the city council to really listen from the heart um, because I think that's where you're gonna make the, the uh, best decisions for all involved. Um, also, I'd like to um, talk about <laughs> the deaths that we have been seeing in our community it's um very um disheartening um these are our brothers and sisters and they're dying at a fast rate just in within the last 24 hours we have had three deaths that i know of within uh, a square blockage um, and that's got to stop and it's only going to get worse. Um, people are getting more desperate as the weather is getting worse. And um, we need to uh, look at other ways of helping our brothers and sisters. Perhaps we can um, look into a partnership with community leagues to open their doors. I know that uh, our community league would be more than happy to um, offer their doors as a shelter uh, in my community uh, where I reside. So maybe that's a, a um, better idea maybe than the LRT system, but I don't believe that ticketing our brothers and sisters in the LRT is good for anybody. It brings animosity to everybody involved. It dehumanizes people, especially when they're trying to just come out from the cold. Um, and as well, our tent fires. We've had so many tent fires. Today on patrol, we had a gentleman that came in with his face full of black soot because he had just pulled his neighbor next door out of his tent so he wouldn't die and in that process his tent went up in flames as well so we had to gift an, a, a brother another tent um uh, he won't go to shelters he said uh so um and i just want to say to people we in this city gave more rights to animals, our animals, than we do our brothers and sisters, you know? And that really hurts my heart that we treat, I mean, I love animals too, and, and gosh forbid that an animal should be out in minus 30. But if we do that to our brothers and sisters. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Judah. So, Thank and that's all I want to say is that please just um, listen with your three ears and especially the heart. Let's put some heart back into this city and stop expelling people and giving punitive measures where our brothers and sisters have no other options. Yeah. Thank you. Judith. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for, uh, for sharing your, uh, your pain sure. and uh, and uh, and speaking on behalf of the community really 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 appreciate your uh, passion and your commitment and the work that you 
You do. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let me see if there are questions from uh, from colleagues. Uh, if not, I'll I'll start. Councillor Wright, can you take the chair? Uh, I have the chair. I just, uh, Judith, uh, thank you so much for your passion. I just want you to know that if you were aware of uh, some of the work that uh, city has undertaken uh, uh, in uh, with with council direction on the. Uh, implementation of the anti-racism strategy. That uh, work is funded, proposed to be funded, uh, and also uh, we, our administration has developed our action plan to TRC recommendations, uh, so that work will be funded, hopefully, in this budget is recommended to be funded, as well as uh, city's action plan on, uh, on, the, uh, on the missing and murdered Indige indigenous women and girls calls to action. Uh, so that work is also proposed to be funded. I just want you to know that there are actions that the this, this city council is taking on a number of those things. And I hear you, we all hear you, that we need to step up on the, uh, on the, on the uh, 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 houselessness crisis and uh, other mental health crisis. Just want you to know that there, we are aware of all those challenges and we're working hard and we need to do more, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you so much for your passion. And I'll take the chair back, Councillor Tang. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to Heather and Judith for um, your, uh, your heart uh, and in your speech. Um, so Judy, uh, I was wondering, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about value of mutual aid groups like yours. And I'm wondering, um, and even the last time you came to council to speak about this issue, and I'm wondering, does city staff, uh, has, has, has city staff reached out to you to talk about ways that you can better work together uh, between the city and mutual aid and other agencies and partners? Um. The city did reach out and they uh, gifted us uh, bus tickets, which is uh, kind of, in my opinion, it's like an oxymoron because here you guys are um, allowing your peace officers and EPS uh, to issue out tickets to our brothers and sisters and then you're giving us bus tickets that we no doubt will will um, give to our brothers and sisters, you know, so that they don't get the ticket. Because if they've got that ticket or that transfer in their hand, uh, then they they can't be ticketed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and <clears throat> on the on the peace officer front. Um, you know, given this uh, new model that we've been kind of working towards with the COT, uh, the community outreach transit teams, so that does pair peace officer and social workers to take that kind of more, you know, a, a different approach that's not just purely enforcement. Um, in your day-to-day -day on the ground, in that interaction, have you been noticing any kind of difference? Uh, no, not, I have not personally, no. Um, and probably because they're too far and few between, you know, mm -hmm. so they're not making a big enough impact where our brothers and sisters are talking about it. Um, if you're going to go that approach, it needs to have more of, of social workers, more um, mental health uh, professionals who are able to um, understand uh, the psychosis of our brothers and sisters and what they go through on a daily basis. Our brothers and sisters are constantly in a turmoil of trauma. They're once they actually, I don't even think they get over any of the trauma. They still carry it within themselves, you know, not until they're in a safe place and have a room with four walls and a roof and they can close the door and scream in their pillow or, or cry in, on their bed you know what I mean mm -hmm. like where do our brothers and sisters have that outlet they don't have that outlet and that's what's so infuriating mm -hmm. um yeah thank you for that and um lastly I I really appreciate your point about um maybe non-traditional partners like community leagues to provide some of those shelter spaces 
Um, my understanding was that, is that there are certainly conversations like that, including with our faith community. Mm -hmm. um, and but you 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 see that sort of as a temporary uh, kind of a band aid solution. Then we and do you still foresee you know long term um, still shelter and um, or permanent shelter and housing solutions? Absolutely. We need to do housing first. And that's really what our long term goal should be. And especially because of the climate uh, change, the climate, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we're seeing weather um, and things, anomalies that we haven't ever seen before, such as an earthquake in northern Alberta, you mm -hmm. know, uh, yeah. like who, you yeah. know, we never saw that before ever. That's due to climate change, yeah. you know, Absolutely. these things like, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. And um uh, and I think it's disheartening to hear that you know, despite the the terrible condition that people are living in, they're still not choose they're still choosing not to go to shelter, and we still need to remove a lot of those barriers so that that you know it becomes a better option for people uh, rather than having their tents being set on fire, like you said, right? Yeah, um, and it's a real, real uh, tragedy. Yeah. And I'm sorry to say that we're just at the beginning of this season and already within less than 24 hours, three are dead. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank, th thank you, Judith. And thank you, Heather, for your patience throughout the three days. Uh, I'm, I'm completely impressed by all the personal stories you and your friends have come forward to share. Thank you. Thank you, Costner. Thank you, Costner. Thank right. Thank you very much. Um, Judith, <clears throat> sorry, um, my, my question was pretty well along the same lines as, as Councillor Tanks. Um, there is an unfunded package in our budget for, um, for more um, transit peace officers to, to work with this COT team, right? Um, but it, you, you haven't heard much about what the existing service has been like? Uh, not uh, really from our brothers and sisters, no. And... Um, I can only attribute that to um, them not feeling safe around them. Because of the uniform or? That's correct. Okay. Yeah, because of the uniform. Our brothers and sisters, period, do not feel safe around peace officers or EPS. Um, literally, I'm, I mean... Uh, I hear I, we have account after account, lived experience of the uh, mistreatment and um, uh, the um, physicality. In, in me, personally, I was accosted by a peace officer on camera while I was doing a live. She purposely bumped right into me and then she circled back and got into my space where I was able to give her a butterfly kiss with my eyelashes. You know, that's how close she was within in me. And then she has been uh, targeting us every time that we go out in the LRT. She's right there. And uh, she even Googled me and was... Uh, it, she was just being facetious and and malicious if you know malicious is the word better word and um that's to me i'm I, and i'm you know i'm a, a civilian i have a home uh, i have you know how are they to our brothers and sisters when nobody else is around so but do you think having them paired up with somebody from bentero um sort of might temper that that perception ease things it should if we have a better ratio okay. you know like probably i'd say like three social workers or two social workers to one peace officer you know okay. just so that our brothers and sisters can see friendlies okay. they don't see friendlies when it comes to peace officers they see peace officers that are going to ticket them, that are going to shoo them away, that are going to, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of our brothers and sisters are mental health and. Right. So if, if they had that other resource there with with the transit uh, peace officers then and, and with the the ability to, to offer them some safe shelter um, or or assistance with mental health or, or whatever else that they were needing. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, but uh, I don't think that our um, this year, this winter's plan with the bus um, warming buses, as you're calling them, I don't think that's a good solution. I think that those buses can't be everywhere and at all times, and um, our brothers and sisters don't like to be on a bus. <laughs> Uh, traveling and stuff they'd much rather be in a stationary place you know some people are are dope sick and can't be in in movements um you know so being in a bus is not a good solution and it's just a little band-aid of a solution if you ask me you know the other morning on monday morning we started and this was just the first day of cold we started the morning with a little girl who had frostbit her toes were already already black and then we ended the patrol with an older gentleman who uh, had gotten frostbit three times already and he said oh I got to go back to the hospital right now because I can feel it setting in and he says that because he's had it so many times he's more susceptible and it gets worse and worse every time so you know and we're and did you hear about the doctor from the emerge, Doctor Dung, who re, uh, just realized that we're doing too many amputations when it comes to frostbite, too many amputations, and they're all from our brothers and sisters. You know, we're ha we're giving life sentences to people that could could quite easily pull out of the addictions, pull out of, of uh, what brought them there to the streets to begin with. And we didn't give them that chance because now we've given them a life sentence of being not able to work with their hands again or walk properly to uh, work sh uh, shoulder to shoulder with with the, uh, their uh, fellow man. Yeah, you know thank, what I mean? Thank you, Gail. My, thank my time is up if we not only had the financial but also the human resources to to try to alleviate all these problems. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson. Uh, yes, you thank you so much um, for, for your words and for all the work that you're doing in the community. Um, you know, I, I appreciate your comments. I know, I think a recommendation of the Safer for All report was having, having a more transparent uh, accountability mechanism for city peace officers. Is that, um, is that something that, that you were referring to? Yes, yeah, exactly. We need to fund that and get more people involved um, because let's face it, a lot of uh, peace officers uh, graduate and become EPS. So we want to make sure that the peace officer right out of the gate uh, is treating our brothers and sisters, uh, well, not treating just our brothers and sisters, everybody with uh, uh, human rights and the dignity and the respect everybody needs and not thinking that they're themselves uh, a, a um, uh, police where they can strong arm our brothers and sisters. Mm. You know, they're not there to browbeat. Yeah. They're there to um, give peace, in my opinion. But. Yeah, and, and I understand that there there are ways that um, uh, that that you can um, share any any concerns you might have with peace officers in terms of there's there's some phone numbers and email addresses and, and a, a form as well. But maybe thinking more proactively too, in terms of uh, you know not just responding to to challenging situations. Do you think that there's space for conversation between groups like yours and some of our our frontline city staff, like peace officers and like others, in terms mm -hmm. of training I, insights you can offer? Yeah, absolutely. And I can give you a a good example of that in. Um, we um, have a few volunteers that work as Paladin Security at the Stanley Milner Library. Now, as you know, the one downtown is frequented a lot by your brothers and sisters. And uh, since uh, the group of volunteers come with us, um, they notice when they're on 
uh, duty and they have their uniform on, um, the brothers and sisters approach them differently. They treat them with much better reverence. And um, and they have, they said, uh, Kamal, for instance, she said uh, her experience then and now are like night and day, she said, you know, so she tells um, uh, the other uh, paladin at uh, Stanley Milner to come on patrol with us too. So we've had about five um, uh, security come on patrol with us. And, you know, we're more than happy to, to uh, have people come on patrol with us and um, show exactly how we gift of our energy and our heart to our brothers and sisters who are always seen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's that's such a such an inspiring and interesting example that you've shared. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Judith and uh, Heather. Uh, so this concludes the questions to this. I'm sorry. Oh, Councillor Paquette. Sorry, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just having trouble logging in for some reason. No worries. Uh, yeah. No, I just want to pick up on that. Um, you know, you're doing such a good job and we're asking you so many questions, but I hope you're okay with this. Um, we have a lot of people uh, in our city who feel sort of angry and resentful uh, about the fact that there is a, a homeless population. They feel that uh, those folks are, are there by choice or that if we offered help, they wouldn't accept it or they feel angry that their tax dollars, and they've been good folks their whole life, so to speak, are going to, toward helping people who are not willing to help themselves. That's sort of the attitude that we get from a certain sector. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to that? Uh, I would say that um, every human being on Mother Earth has a right to be here and I don't believe that it's up to any one of us to um, point fingers at anyone um, it, it, because of their circumstance. Now um, a lot of our brothers and sisters are there because their family has given up on them uh, because um, they have no family. Uh, like for instance, me, that's how I ended up on the street years and years ago was because I had, uh, the government took away my family. Um, you know, uh, a lot, there's so many th different things going on uh, on the street and our brothers and sisters just want to be seen. That's all. And and they are beautiful human beings. Like I tell you, I've never uh, met so many people with so little, but with such big hearts. Um, our community knows each other, knows what each other's addiction is, uh, why that person's uh, where they are. You know, they um, try to help one another. Like, for instance, today we had a lady who was mis displaced. Her tent was gone, so she had all her belongings on a pallet. And uh, she had three brothers who just came up and helped her pull it across the street, you know, so she, she could bring all her little stuff like our brothers and sisters get it they yeah. understand and that's what um people with privilege could never understand that kind of struggle because they've never been there and that's okay because not everybody needs to understand but what we do have to all do together as a society is make sure that we're all safe and we're all accounted for and when we leave people out in the cold, we're not doing that. Can I ask you another question then? Mm -hmm. On the city level, I can assure you that we will be doing absolutely everything in our power to, to, to work on this. But that those who are actually legislatively and financially responsible are the province. Mm -hmm. And we are going to step in because it's the right thing to do. So don't worry about that. Mm. But what would you say to a province that could solve this and in solving it actually save money 
for the province. It saves money. What would you say to them for allowing people to suffer, to get amputations, and to die on our streets when it is 100% preventable and less expensive to help than it is to have the situation as it is now? What would you say to them? I would say listen to the people and uh, do, I mean, you're there to to do the people's will. So uh, the public outcry is severe and fierce and to listen to the people. And uh, the people will continue to um, uh, watch one another because that's what we do as community. You know, community can take care of community. And no matter what the provincials will do, we're going to do our utmost to try to take care of of yeah. as much as we can but we can't do, do it can. without their help that's right okay well i appreciate and i really appreciate all the labor you've put into this it's so much and i understand that so intimately so thank you hi hi well i tell you i thank you guys too for uh keeping it um in your minds and your hearts um, because these are real human beings, real lives that matter. And, um, and I know it's a difficult job that you have ahead. And I really appreciate you guys taking these three day long days. I did listen to what I could. And, uh, I was very impressed with the great people of Edmonton and, uh, you guys for listening and all your wonderful questions and comments. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judith. Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, okay, any any other council member questions? Uh, seeing none, so that concludes the questions to this panel. So at this time, I would like to ask if any member of the public who registered to speak uh, hasn't had the chance to be heard. Any member of any member of the public who registered to speak on this non-statutory public hearing hasn't had the chance to be heard. Seeing none, and I'll ask. I'll take a motion, uh, Councilor Tang. Uh, you want to do that? Uh, um, sure. Uh, some, I'm yeah. happy to move that the October 31st, 2022 Financial and Corporate Services Report (FC). S01393 and the November 14th, 2022 Financial and Corporate Services Report FCS01394 and FCS01478 be postponed to the November 30th, 2022 City Council meeting. Okay, I need a seconder. Second. Councilor Stevenson seconded it. So we have a motion on the floor Anyone to speak or comment? Sorry, it's not comment. Speak. Uh, seeing, I know we'll go to budget, but just to have to ask, just in case, right? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, please, well, oh, sorry, Councillor Paquette. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Mr. I didn't know that you were going to give us an opportunity to speak. Not necessarily. Uh, again, yeah, we're just going through procedures, but. Uh. <laughs> yeah, okay. well, I would just uh, really quickly, I just have to say that this has been uh, a phenomenal experience this year, uh, listening to all of these submissions. And I, I'm so grateful for all the people to, who came out. I'm so grateful to our clerks who organized this in such a seamlessly uh, painless way. It's been phenomenal. And I also want to thank uh, fellow councillors and, and uh, our colleagues here who have asked really wonderful and insightful and perceptive questions. Um, I, you know, I know that uh, there's a lot of worry about where this budget is going. But one thing that I always find interesting, Mr. Mayor, is that many years ago, and you might remember this, there were some very high tax rates. Uh, so, upwards in the in the almost ten percent so region. Councillor Paquette, I'm going to I'm going to stop. Sorry, I'm going to well, stop. Well, I will just finish up, Mr. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Okay. And I will say that uh, you know a few years ago, our tax rate was actually at zero percent and one point three percent. And the thing is, these things have and flow. And whatever we land on, 
we're, it's going to be landed on according to the will of the people. And this is part of that process. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I do appreciate uh, you allowing me to speak. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. Yeah, it could be a motion, uh, motion on the floor, so please vote. Just missing one vote, Councilor Jones. Uh, sorry, it's not coming up for me. This is just acceptance and closure of the public hearing. Yeah, just a motion to postpone the reports that are part of the agenda okay, as part yeah. of the budget process. Sorry, hold on one sec. So do, you're not having a motion to close the public. You've heard no. from all of the public. What we need to now do is take all of these budget reports and send them over to your budget deliberations. You're just postponing the reports. Yeah. All right. That's all that we're doing. Okay, I'll, I'll deliberate on it briefly, and I think I can accept this, yes. Okay. I'll vote yes. We have all the votes. Thank you. Thank you for your, what is that word? Magnanimity? Magnanimity. Unanimity. Magnanimity, something like that, right? So, okay, okay. Constant Jans. <laughs> Please vote. Is all voted? That is, that is carried. Okay. All right. Uh, bylaws, none. Private reports, none. Notice of motions or motions without customary notice. None. Before we adjourn, I want to take a moment to uh, thank everyone from uh, the clerk's office. Uh, the support they provided us to the public over the last uh, uh, three days is was phenomenal. Yeah, and, and also, like, you got positive feedback from uh, the public, which is very important, and that tells you that how seamlessly the system worked. Uh, and also want to take a moment for the administration for, uh, uh, you know, taking all the notes and listening to members of the public. And, uh, and uh, I hope that as we get into the budget, uh, all that input will inform our decision, and, uh, and I am confident that administration will assist us in achieving the, uh, the goals that we are here to achieve, right? So uh, thank you to everyone, and uh, finally, everyone, members of the public, for uh, engaging your insightful uh, uh, presentations uh, and your commitment to uh, uh, to building a better city, and it's, uh, as Councilor Perquette said, it was just uh, uh, inspiring, inspiring three days. Uh, sometimes we feel that uh, we're sitting through through these long meetings; they can be tiring. Yes, sometimes they are tiring, but uh, every every presentation was inspiring from everyone. Uh, so thank you so much to each and every one of them. And now we are adjourned. And uh, we will break for half an hour. How, how about?